All right, let's get rolling. Uh, Township Committee meeting for July 12th, uh, 2021. This is via Zoom remote access, normally held at the Delanco Township Municipal Building, 770 Coopertown Road. Uh, roll call, please, Mrs. Lohr. Mr. Brown. Here. Mrs. Patrick. Here. Ms. Holland. Here. Mr. Olette. Here. Mr. Templeton. Here. Also present, uh, let's see, Mr. Schwaber, Township Administrator, Mr. Fox, our Township Engineer, Mr. Heinhold, Township Solicitor, Mrs. Lohr, Municipal Clerk, Mrs. Martin, Deputy Municipal Clerk. Uh, I believe Mr. Fenimore is out on the road uh, unclogging storm drains. We have Chief De DeSanto is present. And let's see, and uh, Ms. Aaron Provenzano is our technical specialist. Uh, I do not have a flag at this location, but uh, we all know what it looks like. So if you join me in a flag salute, please. I pledge allegiance. Pledge allegiance to, to the, flag flag the United, United States, 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 States of America, America and to the Republic for which it stands, one, one nation, nation under God, God indivisible, God. with liberty and justice God. for all. Thank you. Uh, sunshine statement, Mrs. Lohr. Please be advised that proper notice of this meeting has been given in compliance with the Open Public Meetings Act in the following manner. Written notice has been mailed to the Burlington County Times and Courier Post and published in the January 5th, 2021 editions. Written notice has been posted on the official bulletin board of the, of the Township of Delanco at least 48 hours prior to the meeting. This meeting is being held uh, via a Zoom virtual uh, platform. The meeting ID and code and login information have been posted on the Township website and on the bulletin board and the front window of the Delanco Municipal Building. Advanced public comments are accepted via written letter or electronic email uh, at least six hours prior to the meeting. And the uh, members of the public who wish to make their comments or have their questions done during the meeting public comment session may either make their comments or questions via, via audio or by typing their comment or question into the Zoom platform chat option. Okay. And the agenda for this uh, meeting has been available on the township website at delancotownship.com. Thank you. All right, uh, let's see, public comment statement. Um, uh, Mike, could I interrupt you for a moment, for a moment sure. of silence? Um, we lost um, one great man on July 1, Colonel Robert Dean Hinkle passed away. Oh. And I'd like to have a moment of silence in his uh, memory. Thank you. Thank you. Colonel Hinkle was uh, one of a kind, and uh, I believe his uniform is still in the display case. At, uh, actually, actually, we returned it to Riverside. Um, he was 92 years old and um, just an incredible gentleman, probably one of the finest men I've ever known. And um, he will be sadly missed by everyone. His, um, if anyone wants to know, his service for visitation is to Wednesday night uh, from six to seven at um, the Zion, the Zion Lutheran Church in Riverside, and a service will follow at seven. Okay. Thank you, Kate. Uh, let's see. Uh, just an, an overview of tonight. We've got. Uh, uh, reasonably put consent agenda. Uh, we do have a full plate of discussion items and being the only meeting this month uh, at present, uh, we do have our normal professional and department head reports along with township committee reports. Uh, at the end, we do expect uh, to have an executive session uh, on some uh, contract uh, personnel issues. And then as usual, we'll come back in uh, for public session. So uh, just an overview of what we have tonight. A public comment statement, uh, uh, purpose of public comment session is to allow residents to share information and or views with the Town Lanco Township Committee. Since the committee may be hearing the information for the first time, it is not always possible to have issues and questions settled within the public comment session. Uh, let's see, report of advance remote meeting comments or questions. Mrs. Lord, are there anything in advance? Nothing in advance. I have some correspondence for later. Okay, uh, let's see. 
The meeting is now open to the public for comments and questions. This is session one. Uh, as is customary, uh, please state your name and address and uh, your question, please, or comments. May I? William Trimble, 430 Perkins Lane. Hello, Mr. Trimble. Good evening. Hi, good evening, uh, Mr. Mayor. How are you? I'm dry. <laughs> Unlike my basement, but you know that's been a problem since we bought the house. Ouch. Um, I wanted to comment on something that was brought up at the last meeting regarding the uh, township property next to our land uh, here at 430 Perkins, which is we all know is an undeveloped piece of um, th um, right of way between Kansas and uh, Perkins Lane. Uh, I had been out, I had had John Fenimore did stop by. We were concerned with uh, some debris from the storm of last August, some broken trees and the like on or near to our property line. Um, we have since had a contractor out to take down three trees that are on our property. In the, pro <clears throat> excuse me, in the process of them doing that, they did clear a path to the back of the property where the uh, debris on the township part is located. Um, our concerns are several. Um, some of it is a little over the property line onto our property. Um, it's been dead for over a year, a lot of the broken items that were knocked down. So they've now dried out. We're looking at a bit of a fire hazard. Also, we are experiencing a whole lot of mosquito and um, these Chinese lantern flies um, from that area. And we think that the overgrowth, et cetera, is contributing to that. Um, I've sent new more pictures since we had the work done. John has them and um, Mr. Reeves, the um, the inspector, I believe, if yep, I have yep. the name correctly. Yes. Yeah, I sent them to him also. So there is access now. And I know that was a topic of discussion at the last meeting. And we'd be more than happy to give the township guys permission to be on our side of the property line. They could get back there and clean some of that up because it's becoming an issue. Okay. Uh, I believe a uh, uh, shade tree was brought in on this uh, being township property and township trees. I know Mr. Schwab has been uh, 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 maintaining uh, contact on this, this matter. It's, it's, it's a fairly large strip of land there that, uh, mm -hmm. that, uh, that uh, stretch there. It's about a thousand feet long or so that stretches all the way up. So it's, it's not insignificant. Um, no, it's not. So it's, uh, and I was, I stopped out there last week to, to take a look at it and you're absolutely right. Um, so I, I don't know where we, where things stand now as far as if Shade Tree got in there to take a look or what, uh, where we are as, as far as public works. Uh, John, do you got a comment, Mr. Brown? Yes. Uh, we, <clears throat> Shade Tree Commission did advise Mr. Sibilia or certified tree expert uh, forestry management uh, to take a look at the property and he had inquired about gaining act. You know, basically, this man's experience uh, was with the utility company, Jersey Power and Light, and uh, you know had these issues uh, throughout New Jersey. And basically, is if it falls in the forest, the forest owns it. Um, I know that's probably not what Bill wants to hear, but can everybody hear? You're breaking You're up. Breaking up. Uh, and you hear me because I'm getting a thing. My internet. Okay. Yeah, your video is so, uh, frozen. I don't. And you're, you're breaking up a bit. Okay, I'll try again later during my public during my comment. Mayor, Bill, Mayor, what I can tell you right now is, okay. is that we we are looking at it and we're trying to you know find a solution there. Uh, the main thing, as you're well well aware of, is just just the access to it, and that's what the Mr. Fenimore uh, uh, had the biggest issue with or problem that he can't really get in to get to the problem trees or the deadfalls that have, have dropped on your side of the fence 
Um, well, we, the, the folks that worked on it, they were able to come back with just a small, one of those little Bobcat front end loaders and drag some items out. And I understand that the whole piece of property is rather large, but if even something could just be done with the items close to our, to our property line, is cleared back a bit, maybe not all the way, but just the deadfalls, at least the deadfalls from the storm. Again, so we don't have that dry wood fire load. You know, that would be a great first step. Uh, I don't know if Mr. Payet was trying to, to chime in there with, with something. Yeah. Uh, yes, Mayor. Uh, thank you. Um, John Paye, 101 Delvue Lane. Uh, regarding um, the question that John was trying to answer about Shade Tree, uh, the arborist has been um, commissioned, I'll say, to go ahead and go through that township property and write his recommendations uh, on trees that uh, will need any work or trimming or anything like that. So hopefully we'll have a report from him at our next meeting. Oh, great, thank you. And that, can is he starting at West Avenue? Is he starting at that end or is he starting at, the, at some intermediate spot? I'm not sure where he's starting, but it's he's supposed to do the whole parcel in question. All right. Um, I also ask, could I also ask who's responsible for directly across the street from us? Because that also is very overgrown, and obviously it's also going to be a source of mosquitoes and the uh, lantern flies. Hmm. I think it's BCAP or whoever owns BCAP now, but I'm not sure. And if it, whomever it is, if the township could maybe push them a bit to clean that up also, because I'm sure if you drive by, you'll see it's basically a wall of foliage and broken trees also. All right, we'll look into that. Thanks for uh, thanks for coming in tonight, Mr. Trimble. I appreciate your attention. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, any other comments? Public comment session uh, to session one. Yes, Mr. Mayor Matt Bartlett. Uh, just real quick on behalf of DISA, just want to remind any parents uh, that this is the last week for our soccer registration that are open online right now are false. Uh, parents can go go online and register at DISASports.org. Our season will be starting uh, first week of September, give or take. Very good, thank you. <laughs> Any other comments from the public before I close this session? Hearing I don't, I don't see anything in the chat. There right, is very good. In the, in the chat section. I'll uh, close this session, uh, public comment session no number one, comments and reports, uh, professionals. Let's start off with Mr. Fox. Uh, thank you, Mayor. Um, our 2001 road program, um, as you know, was awarded at last meeting. Uh, we had the pre-construction meeting last week um, Lambert, with Lambert Construction, and that is the combination of the DOT grant, the local aid, or the local funds um, program, as well as the Fields Greens parking lot and the Public Works parking lot. Um, they are Planning to start uh, mid-August. Their, their completion date is October 25th by contract. Um, however, we did talk to them about getting the Field Dreams parking lot finished first, because I understand that the uh, that the soccer uh, um, is starting in in August. In, in um, I don't remember the exact date, but but mid-August as well. So the contractor did indicate, and I'm trying to get an exact schedule, but he did indicate that he will get it done before the, uh, the soccer season starts, um, the, the parking lot. Um, the uh, Cooperstown uh, Road sidewalk uh, in front of Town Hall, we have our proposal in, and that's a discussion item, I believe, for tonight. Uh, the Newton's Landing head wall. Um, we awarded that contract to Thor Construction um, as an emergency. When he was out there doing the work um, through a combination of things, the actual flared end section at the end of the head wall fell in. It, it, it did exactly what we were trying to fix, um, which is a good thing and a bad thing. Um, it's bad for him because it's gonna take him more work to fix it. 
it's good for us because it, we're actually going to get a better job. Um, he had to bring in a crane. Um, he brought one crane that was too small. He had to bring in another crane to lift it up out of the way. Uh, he's now going to form up a concrete footing. Um, actually, we're going to get concrete under the existing pipe now that we weren't going to get before. And we'll set it back in place and finish up the project. Uh, I should be done. He's planning on, or depending on weather, um, planning on pouring the concrete footing this week. Um, and I'll probably be setting the, the flat end section back in place next week. So by the end of next week, it should be complete. The project should be complete. Uh, so if anyone saw a crane out there, that's what it was doing. Um, and the Grand Cook Greenway, um, we, the, the contractor did install a handicap ramp on Grand Cocos and Buttonwood, um, as we as we as we asked. And I'm trying to work it out that it, that gets covered by the by the contract, so it's it won't cost the borough or the township any 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 money for that that ramp. Um, We'll see how that goes, but I, I think we're going to be able to pull that off. So, so that should hopefully be a savings for the town. Um, and that's Harry, all I have this time. If I, Harry, if I can jump in on that, on that, uh, the County Greenway Trail, Mr. Frontermore has had, uh, sent some emails of uh, uh, some sloppy work by the, some of the contractors, leaving uh, broken concrete debris in some uh, residential front yards and also washing out, uh, when they were pouring concrete, washing out the uh, concrete uh, entrails into the street. And uh, uh, he had sent uh, those emails to Mr. Schwab and myself and uh, Mrs. Lohr. And uh, I, I had forwarded the ones I received out to the uh, CME contractor and uh, um, the sub. Uh, and, and got a response. So, uh, in your travels, uh, and and you see them, uh, try to please reinforce uh, that we're not real happy with that. And if they can uh, be a little more professional in their accomplishment of that of that project. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. John John did give me a call on that as well. All right. Um, and yeah, they were washing out their con concrete trucks in, in the street where they shouldn't be. But yeah. they should they shouldn't be doing that anymore. Harry, did we'll you keep an eye on. Uh, I did talk to Scott Taylor and Steve Lennon regarding the corner at Rancocas and uh, Burlington Avenue on uh, this okay. side, and uh, they were going to replace the bricks. And the owner uh, was very concerned because the bricks are very slippery when it rains and in the winter. And so um, the contractor did agree to just re, you know, replace that with concrete, which was much better since it was a walkway, since they're encouraging people to walk there. So those bricks were being returned to John Fenimore at Public Works. Um, he was aware of it. He didn't want the bricks put back there either. So um, that was handled Friday, Thursday and Friday. So I don't know if you knew of that change or not. Okay, so, um, John mentioned that to me as well, uh, but I, I didn't know if, at that time, I didn't know the county approved it or not, but. So yeah, they, they did. They did. Uh, so. I, I called them. Uh, I was on the phone that morning with everybody, and uh, they put the concrete in Friday. So it, it Great. worked out well. Okay. Great. Thanks, Kate. Anything else? Anything else there, uh, Mr. Fox? Nope, that's all I have, man. All right. And uh, I think we've got a sidewalk discussion. Uh, at the end that though yep. we'll need your expertise on. All right, any questions of Mr. Fox from the committee? All right, Mr. Heinold. Uh, Mr. Mayor, everything I've been working on, I think is covered at some point on the agenda tonight. So I'll just address my comments as the items arise and as needed, unless anybody has any questions for me right now. All right, very good. And let's see, next uh, Township Administrator, Mr. Schwab. Thank you. A um, couple minor things. One, if you remember, it's been more than a year that we authorized selling the small vacant lot or by camp meeting grounds. We finally, uh, we've been back and forth with some of the potential buyers and Doug and I finally put together all the paperwork. So we're gonna get that out for them to make their, uh, their bids. Uh, <clears throat> If I get it out by the end of this week, they'll have 45 days for a September 2nd deadline. If we don't get bids 
by then, are there any problems, then I'll come to you at your meeting on the 13th to extend it. Otherwise, uh, I'd rather receive it on the second. And then you, if we get the appropriate bid, you guys can approve them on the 13th. If we wait longer than that, you won't be able to approve it till the end of the month, which is a meeting I won't be at. So I'm hoping 45 days will be sufficient since all the potential bidders have been in correspondence with me for almost a year. So Doug, I think we'll be okay uh, sticking with the September 2nd date. So we'll see how that goes. Also, just uh, for the record, I sent you a, a couple detailed emails on the American Rescue Plan funds. We uh, submitted at the state's request for 100% of the funds that were allocated, federal money coming to the state and then coming to the smaller municipalities. And uh, the 2021 allocation is 231,000. We currently have the ability to uh, apply 53,000 for our loss of revenue from last year, which will show up as unanticipated revenue and therefore add to our available surplus. Uh, we'll discuss probably more detail uh, over the next six months, whether there's anything that we legally can uh, use the balance of the funds for. Uh, it was pointed out that even if we don't use the funds, we should accept them, we receive them, we'll get a similar amount next year and uh, whatever doesn't get used, we return in 2026. We get to keep the interest earnings, we're told. Uh, we're assuming that there's gonna be some changes in the regulations in terms of use between now and then so that uh, the money perhaps will not <clears throat> need to be returned and we can actually use it for the benefit of our uh, community. So we've been forwarding off to all of you all the, the details of all the things we're gonna be used for and I'm sure there'll be some ideas and suggestions that you can discuss over the next several months. Nothing needed to be done about that right now. And the last thing to note is that the <clears throat> personnel policies need to be updated again for the joint insurance fund. And uh, I've started working on them along with our uh, labor attorney, Susan Hodges. The problem is that they uh, gave us a whole new format, which is instead of just fixing what we have, they're suggesting we start fresh and we have to make some comparisons. It's not required, but uh, Susan and I will have to go through that and make a recommendation to you. We have until uh, uh, the beginning of November to have that signed off on, adopted and signed off on, to ensure that our deductibles for our employment practices liability and that type of liability uh, remain as low as possible. So that's just a significant piece of work that we're working on. Once they get adopted, then we have to train everyone in all the new rules and regulations. That's what I have for right now. All right, thank you. Uh, let's see, department hit. Uh, Chief DeSanto. Thank you, Mayor. Uh, I'll go over just a couple things and then when we get to discussion items, I have uh, more details in reference to Creek Road and, um, and addressing that issue that's on the discussion item. The two items I have is um, you'll see there is a resolution to um, donate surplus equipment to the Washington Fire Company. Uh, we, uh, we took a patrol vehicle out of uh, use and there was no need for the overhead lights and it wasn't compatible with the newer cars. Uh, the control head has been updated and, and so um, and we still need that control head for the detective. So that patrol vehicle is going to be, you know, markings removed, light bar taken off, and cages and interior equipment um, for, for in terms of uh, prison transport. It's going to be taken out and was taken out. So that was the uh, agreement. We donated surplus equipment that we had that was, was not compatible with current police vehicles. And in turn, the fire department came and took out all the equipment that we're not going to need and uh, the vehicle, which is going to become the detective's vehicle. So that's where that res resolution's there, uh, trying to uh, help out the fire department. And in turn, they helped us out. Um, also, the signs uh, came up over the weekend for the no parking. We put the message board out there. And um, some tickets are being written to trucks. And I'm sure the board will eventually get around. Uh, the, it's not uh, constant. But there are trucks there at times, and the officers are doing uh, daily checks to make sure there's no trucks parked there. If they are, then they're ticketing them. 
So that should uh, resolve that problem on Enterprise Drive after a week or so by the time the word gets out. Uh, I did ask uh, Misfits to report to their uh, carriers uh, last week that this was coming and uh, try to save themselves from getting tickets. So, so far so good. The other uh, thing I want to address is with the Field of Dreams parking lot being, um, I guess, refurbished. Uh, I asked Mr. Fox, I don't know if he had the opportunity, but the suggestion was made that uh, we should put a weight limit on the uh, driveway entrance to 501 Creek Road in order to deter uh, trucks from going using that parking lot as the turnaround. So we would need an ordinance for that uh, lane roadway. I don't know what the technical term would be. And uh, I don't know if uh, Mr. Fox was bouncing the idea between four tons and two tons and maybe a happy medium of three tons. So uh, I'll give him a chance to, if he had the opportunity to look into that. Harry, did you get a chance to look into the recommended time? Uh, thank you, I just need it. Uh, I, I did, um, and typically, it, it, I, Depending on what type of vehicles you want to keep out of there, um, you can use up to 10 tons. Um, a bucket truck, like a, like a PSNG bucket truck, is is about 12 tons. Um, so depending on what type of truck you want to keep out of there, it's just tractor trailers. You can use you can use 10 tons. Um, I would recommend probably five, and then you can use your discretion on how you want to handle that. All right, thank you. Yes, yeah, so, so my recommendation would be to post uh, pass the ordinance and then uh, post a sign there uh, with the weight restriction just to discourage uh, those commercial trucks from turning around there. And that's the, uh, that was the catalyst for the Creek Road issue. Uh, I'll go into as businesses uh, on Long Creek Road that you know prompted us to take action. So I'll go into detail about that, but uh, that's all I have right now. And Mr. Fenimore called me, he's running around blocking streets for the flooding, so. Yeah, uh, um, Jesse, would it benefit um, to also have uh, no U-turn in that ordinance? So if that's what it's being used for? Well, I mean, if you have a no U-turn, that means the trucks can enter there. And then once they enter there, then what are they gonna do? You know what I mean? Yeah. I, I'd rather have a yeah, okay. weight restriction. And so they see that they can't even turn down that lane. Okay. Um, and then and them being there on that road is a violation rather than you sit there waiting. If you happen to catch them making a the U-turn or coming in, coming out. So I think uh, giving them advance notice, not even to turn down there, I think would be the best best way to deter them from going in there. Okay, good. Harriet, on, on the chief's question on the on the weight limit, is is there what how heavy a truck could uh, would do damage doing doing a turnaround donut in the parking lot there? I mean that's that's kind of the limitation we're looking for. Yeah, basically anything over above a, a, a panel van you wouldn't want on there. Um, you know, if, if there's a contract with a panel van, that's pretty much your top limit. Yeah. And that'd be, they're what, four or five tons, right? They're about, yes. The, 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 the larger ones are about four tons. Yeah. I mean, it's really the, you know, the, the tight radius turn and turning around there that's going to be scuffing up and, and, and pushing the, the blacktop on a hot day and, and rucking it up. So exactly, exactly. That's, that's really your limitation that you're looking for. Yeah, and I, and, I, and I think five tons is, is a good a good number. Like I said, that would that would essentially would let you know a general contractor with a panel van come in there, but it would not let a bucket truck or any kind of dump trucks, anything anything like that. No buses. All right, very good. Thank you, uh, Mr. Fenimore is out on the road. Uh, administration, Mrs. Lohr. trying to unmute. Okay. Uh, just uh, you have an additional resolution, which was emailed to you earlier today. 
to add to the consent agenda. It's resolution 2021-96, authorizing and endorsing, endorsing an application to the New Jersey Department of Environmental Protection, um, NJUCF, which is New Jersey Urban and Community Forestry Program, grant program. So um, that was, this is a result of a grant that was submitted Friday um, by the Shade Tree Commission by Mr. Matt Levitt on behalf of the Shade Tree Commission for re, uh, forest, uh, reforestation and tree planting efforts. So you add that to your consent agenda. And that's it for now, thank you. We'll talk about that separately. All right, uh, let's see, administration, uh, Mrs. Martin, anything from planning board? Uh, I don't have anything to report from the planning board at this time. I do want to report that um, with respect to financial disclosure statements, we did have 100% compliance from everyone. Um, I want to thank the various um, <clears throat> chair people of the boards uh, who helped me reach out to members. Unfortunately, we seem to have a problem with new members of the rec commission not receiving my emails because they were all going into spam. So we're going to have to look into that situation and find out why emails from the municipal building are going into people's spam files instead of to them. Erin Provenzano did reach out and was able to get all the new members to do their financial disclosure statements. So we're all good, um, which makes me happy because most of them are volunteers and I do not wanna see any volunteer get hit with a fine from the state. So um, that's all I have for now. Thank you for the uh, good work for way too long to uh, look out it for people. It was a lengthy process this year. <laughs> look out for people's, uh, yeah, not getting a, uh, a ticket from Trenton. So, all right. Uh, let's see. Township committee. Who wants to start? Mrs. Uh, Ms. Fitzpatrick. Uh, sure. Thank you. Um, the seniors will be holding their next meeting Wednesday at 12 o'clock at the pavilion at the Field of Dreams. Um, and um, Randy Cherkis did forward to me the information regarding the senior services that will be available for Delanco residents. Uh, I forwarded that to Janice and Bev Beverly Russell today to actually post that on our website and uh, to let them know. And I'll distribute this information to them at their meeting on Wednesday. Um, the um, I'll, I was uh, happy to attend uh, two new business openings in town on Saturday. Uh, we have yoga at the Delaware in the camp meeting ground together with uh, uh, Weller's Jewelers and uh, their places look great and it was really nice to see a crowd out there and I said that this is what makes a small town great is that everybody supports one another. The other um, businesses in town actually uh, Lou's Deli, Pie Down, Christina's, Vinnie's, they all supported in some way for some of the food uh, or they had a drawing too. So it was really nice to see everybody chip in and welcome these two new businesses in town. Um, the concert from last Thursday is rescheduled for this Thursday night. Um, 507 Burlington Avenue, I did forward a copy of that email to Richard and Janice. Um, they're just waiting for their permit. They have the PSCNG has capped um, the utility there and they've applied for a demolition permit. So I don't know if that's been issued yet, but it says uh, they're just waiting for the permit. Um, the sewer authority meets tomorrow night and the history board met last week. I was unable to attend. So I did send them a written report of everything that was happening in town. So they would have it on record. Um, they are continuing to work on the historic designations for several properties in town. And uh, their next meeting in August will still be um, via Zoom. And uh, I think that covers everything I have. Yep, that's good. I'm done. Thank you. 
And uh, thank you for the uh, moment of silence for uh, Colonel Hinkle. Uh, let's see, Ms. Holland, you still there? Yeah, I'm still here. Um, so I guess the major thing that I'll report on, um, I did one of the more interesting things that I've done with this sleepless day uh, after work which was attend the, um, the tour that was given in Maplewood at the Apothecarium Dispensary. Okay. Um, it was, yeah, it was uh, really well attended. They wound up splitting into two different groups. So there was a 9.30 and a 10.15. So I made it out to the 10.15 and I'll say it wasn't anything like what I expected. It was a really, I don't dare I say classy joint, um, just like they're they're striving to be like an upscale kind of business right now they're obviously only doing medical uh, dispensing but they're moving or you know moving forward with um, the expectation that they'll be able to do adult use soon um, you know since our last couple of meetings where we've discussed this I've kind of had like a pit in my stomach wondering if we were doing the right thing. Um, you know, passing the ordinance to opt out for now. And I'm going to say, you know, the, uh, the Janice, the League of Municipalities president, or um, I think that's what her role is. She was there and we got some time to speak um, pretty frankly about just the direction that this law is still being shaped, that the, the rules are kind of coming from municipalities and counties that are brave enough to opt in um, on, on kind of the forefront. And listening to the woman that was running the tour for the apothecarium, um, there's still so much to unknown. And, and I really do believe that there is gonna be a place in Delanco for a medical dispensary slash adult use place. But I don't think that that time is now. She couldn't answer some pretty basic questions, I felt. Um, and and the, the league was there saying, yeah, that's not worked out yet. So things like, you know, there's the 6.25% state tax, and then our 2% would come on top of that. But as of 2022, um, people with medical use cards, they're not going to have to pay the state tax but it's still unknown whether they're gonna pay the 2% municipal tax. So if that's the only thing, like if they're getting towns to buy in and, and accept this in their communities with the, the feel good of a medical dispensary, knowing that they're helping you know, elderly people or sick patients or what have you, but then that, that um, incentive of having a tax come out of it, it's not going to come to fruition. Um, other things that came up were, for, for those of us that are interested in um, arms, uh, a firearms license, if you don't already have it, and then you get a medical marijuana card, you'll not be eligible, as things are progressing right now, you won't be eligible to get your firearms permit. But the alternative is, if you already have that permit, then you are still eligible to get your medical use. So some things that don't necessarily make sense. Um, th there was a lot of information. I, I took some notes, so I'll I'll put those once I get my internet back. Um, I'll I'll write those down and share them with the group. Um, but I guess just some smaller points. The the average sales there are between one hundred and fifty dollars, two hundred and fifty dollars per. Um, customer coming in, and it is all cash, although they have introduced a, a cash app, kind of like Venmo, um, and, you know, they, they stressed how bought into it the Maplewood police were, and they regularly interact with them. There's live feeds that go directly to their police station, so there's no, you know, going through a, um, a central office. Um, but, but again, I asked her, so does that mean that we're any closer to being able to address driving under the influence or working under the influence around heavy equipment, monitoring that, regulating it, 
And her answer was frankly, no. Um, she gave kind of a convoluted answer about the way that alcohol interacts in your system, how the more you drink or over the, the passage of an hour, the alcohol in your bloodstream goes up, you know, goes down something. It, maybe it was only convoluted because they didn't fully understand, but basically they still don't have a way to really test for on the spot usage versus what just might be built into your system. Um, and, and all that to say, I, I think we're doing the right thing. If that's still how we're leaning as a committee, um, I'm happy to be on the subcommittee. Um, I just, I think we need time because the rules are just so in flux. And I don't think that our town is prepared to be on the cusp of cutting a cutting edge regulation. I, I don't think that we have that ability to take on the cost and and defense of you know a spot zoning ordinance because we think that we can do that now where you can if a business comes in you can look at them and say this building this is where you can operate and yes you can be a dispensary but there's no on-site usage the presumption is that we can do that but if we can't then our our taxpayers are on the hook for defending that and i don't want to make that mistake so um anyway that was my long-winded um oh, last thing we did say capital startup costs um just for an idea a dispensary requires like one to two million a manufacturing facility is like 10 to 15 and a cultivation so that like the farm setup is 20 to 30 million so just you know for for way down the road if we are considering farming um it at least is not going to be some fly-by-night Cheech and Chong situation, you know, like someone that's just trying to see if they can get their toe in there. Like this is, yeah. there's a lot of money at stake and they're going to have to know what they're doing. So um, I, I was a little reassured about that and um, hearing how they're, uh, I'm going to mispronounce the name of their town where their cultivation site is. I think she called it Boontown or Booton. Um, but either way, they say that the town does not, smell that they really took pains to put in scrubbers and make sure that the emission stacks are way above um, you know any residential uh, wherever it would permeate and, and land and affect the townspeople so I mean take that at face value they they have a vested interest in saying so but um, anyway all in all very interesting and if they do any more tours I, I highly recommend attending they didn't sound like they were going to do a tour of the cultivation facility unfortunately um too regulated and too much risk of cross-contamination so um anyway that's that's what i got great thank you that's great yeah, yeah. great information some really uh yeah good excellent excellent points yeah you don't want to be the uh the beta township for uh new state regulations uh let's see mr brown How's your audio tonight? Okay, can everybody hear me now? Yes. Uh, I had gotten cut off when Mr. Trimble was speaking about the forestation problem, but I believe Dr. John Payet kind of covered for me. Is that what happened? Yes. Okay, so, all right. So I won't continue on that um, other than uh, you know, I did attend a seminar for the Shade Tree Commission about um, tree hazards and identification. The spotted lanternfly is now starting to uh, ruin some crops and vegetation with its, oh, I don't even know what the heck it was called. Their, their uh, yellow pussy thing that they leave behind. So uh, basically it's still an all out war to uh, smush the things and to uh, eradicate them. So uh, we're learning more and more about uh, the spotted lantern fly and how it is starting to damage uh, vegetation. And uh, other than that, I've been on vacation, so I don't, I don't have a lot to report. Thank you. Thank you, John. Uh, let's see, Mr. Allett. Yes, hi. Uh, the only thing I really have to share tonight is uh, more of a concern for parents and uh, their children. Uh, Unfortunately, uh, we're headed to 
out of uh, state to go to a birthday party, which actually turned into going to a funeral. A uh, two-year-old child was left in the back of the car in the heat. Uh, the parent was uh, on the way to work, different routine, dropped the one child off, where normally it was the reverse. Uh, I guess you call it uh, motor mine or uh, you're in the ad zone. Uh, she got to work, went into work. The child was left in the car. Uh, her husband went to pick up the children after he got them work. And uh, he got there and he said, you know, oh, my son's here. Where's my daughter? And they said, well, daughter wasn't dropped off. So she called his wife and she ran out to the car and the child was, uh, had passed away in the car from the heat. Uh, Congress, uh, or at least the House, has passed a Hot Cars uh, Act, uh, and I guess it's waiting to go to the Senate now. But some of the things that were in there, uh, something there were, I guess, a series of errors that were made, not only from the, the parent, but even the uh, the, the childcare uh, facility. Uh, child wasn't dropped off, and there was no uh, no check, you know, uh, giving the parent a call and say, uh, you know, you dropped your son off, but you can drop your daughter off. Uh, just that little piece of uh, could have helped. Uh, the detective who was handling the situation uh, in his interview said, you know, parents need to, when they have children uh, in the car seats, uh, put something in the back seat, get in the habit, put in your pocketbook back there, put your briefcase, put something that you have to open up that back door. Uh, and, you know, that could save the child's life. But uh, in looking at the statistics, you know, you say, how could this happen? Well, over the last 20 years on the information that I was uh, able to see, there's 50 cases a year of this happening. Uh, this happened to this, uh, this family. And three days later, about 50 miles away, and then in another town, the same thing happened to a three-year-old. So, you know, of uh, parents that have small children, you know, spread the word, do the extra uh, check. It's an uncomfortable topic to talk about, but it's better to talk about it this way. And, uh, you know, because parents were busy, you know, well, I would never do that. You know, I would never leave my child in the car, but it does happen. It happens to the best of folks. And that's all I have to share. Thank you. Sorry, Thank you. Fern. Sorry for that loss. Yeah. Thank you. All right, um, let's see. I've been on the road a lot the last uh, two weeks and I'm still on the road. Uh, I've been keeping in touch by phone and uh, fortunately <laughs> I've got lots of minutes on my phone so I can keep keep calling Mrs. Lohr and Mr. Schwab and uh, Mr. Allett to catch up on things and, uh, and uh, keep in contact. Uh, let's see, I think at uh, the last meeting I, uh, I briefed, uh, I had sent back uh, uh, the uh, Delaware River Route 130 corridor plan. Uh, it was uh, a draft uh, document back to the Bridge Commission. Um, Mrs. Martin had uh, uh, also worked on that uh, with the, some of the gross, uh, the larger errors. Uh, we're expecting that to come back and uh, the uh, Citizens Advisory uh, uh, Group will uh, will start looking through that that document and, uh, and then we'll We'll circulate it for various levels of approval. Uh, we have a, a timeline to hit. Uh, all this has to be done by next January. Uh, that sounds like a long way off, but it's got a ricochet back and forth between Trenton and uh, and the townships and the other 11 communities in the uh, Route 130 corridor. Um, still have to get back with the new flood ordinance uh, and uh, distribute that. Uh, and let's see what else have I got here. I think I'll cut it short and get moving on to the consent. Excuse me. 
Uh, consent agenda items. Uh, consent agenda items are considered to be routine, will be enacted with a single motion. Any item requiring discussion will be removed from the consent agenda. All consent agenda items will be reflected in full in the minutes. As Mrs. Lohr mentioned, there was a late ad, a resolution 2021-96, uh, uh, the uh, shade tree grant, uh, New Jersey forestry grant. Does anyone have any questions on that or want that to uh, discuss separately or are you okay with that being added to the consent and uh, do it as a bundle? I'm okay with it. Well, I'm okay with it. Does everybody know that there is a cost share to this grant? Mike, yes. It clean? Yes. Whether it be in-kind services or cash? Yes. Okay. There's been a, a, a intense flurry of uh, information back and forth between Mr. Matalevich and Mr. Schwab and Mr. Hudnell and and trying to get uh, accurate information uh, to make uh, to get this on the uh, the agenda for tonight. So I just wanted to give the opportunity to, uh, if we needed to spend a little more time looking into this. So um, I'll just add it in or read it off as we go. All right, uh, consent agenda items: uh, Ordinance 2021-14, authorizing grant of easement to allow for installation of utility line across block 500 lot 1.01 into thereafter transfer block 500 lot 1.01 in fee to the River's Edge Homeowners Association. This is first reading by title only set public hearing date for August 2nd, 2021 at 7 p.m. Uh, resolution 2021-89 authorizing extension of third quarter taxes pursuant to NJSA 54-4-66.3 parentheses D uh, resolution-90, resolution authorizing approval for submission of a grant application to New Jersey Department of Transportation Municipal Aid Grant Program for improvements to Vine Street, Cedar Street, and Maple Avenue. Resolution-91, authorizing uh, authorized disposal and donation of out-of-service police equipment. Resolution-92, authorizing the tax collector to issue duplicate tax sale certificate. Uh, resolution-93, resolution to cancel property taxes and refund tax overpayment due to total veteran exemption pursuant to NJSA 54-3.30 alpha or 330A, excuse me, that's uh, Seven Swan Court. Uh, resolution-94, resolution to cancel property taxes and refund tax overpayment due to total vet veteran exemption pursuant to NJSA 54-4-3.30A. Uh, Thirty A. Uh, this is two Morrison Drive. Uh, resolution dash ninety five. Rescinding resolution uh, twenty twenty one dash seventy eight. Payment of bills. Uh, account current fund seven hundred ninety seven thousand four hundred thirty five dollars thirty four cents. Payroll one hundred fifty five thousand seven hundred ninety five dollars nine cents. Capital fund eleven thousand three hundred five dollars even. Escrow trust forty five thousand eight hundred ninety one dollars even. Municipal open space four thousand five hundred twelve dollars sixteen cents. Approval of minutes uh, May third, twenty twenty one, May seventeenth, twenty twenty one, June fourteenth, twenty twenty one, and June twenty first, twenty twenty one. Approval of department reports uh, and adding resolution twenty one twenty twenty one dash ninety six. Pulling up the title of that. Uh, dash 96, a resolution authorizing and endorsing an application to the New Jersey Department of Environmental Protection and JTEP, New Jersey, uh, Moza Janice, uh, Urban UCF uh, Stewardship Grant Program. Go back to where I was. And approval of the consent agenda. Motion, please. So moved. Motion by Ms. Fitzpatrick, second. Second. Second by Mr. Allette, roll call. Mr. Brown. Yes. Ms. Fitzpatrick. Yes. Ms. Holland. Yeah. Mr. Allette. Yes. Mr. Templeton. Yes, thank you. Uh, meetings now open to the public for comments and questions, session two. Once again, uh, state your name and address if you have any questions or comments for the uh, Township Committee this evening. Hey Mike, this is uh, Phil McFadden, 410 Maple Ave, Delanco. Good evening. Uh, I have a question and actually this one is for Harry. Um, I know they had done some drainage pipe on Long Hickory. Uh, what was that for, could I ask? 
Yeah, that was um, the existing pipe that was there was collapsing. Um, so we replaced it with the same size pipe, which is all we could fit. Um, so it wasn't really for drainage issues. It was because the, it was for safety. The pipe itself was collapsing in the street. Well, I, I would, once you figure out, I did send an email to every member of the township committee along with you. And uh, I would like you to take a look at them. I, you say it was for safety. I, I would take a look at them pictures when you get a free minute and see how horrible the flooding is there. Yes, I'm under the, I understand we did receive a lot of rain tonight, but this has been an ongoing issue and I'm sure I won't be the last one to complain about this because there was numerous people there taking pictures tonight. Yeah. yeah the, the issue with that is the downstream pipes. It's the, um, th that drains all the way down to Poplar. Um, and there's, there's many issues along that whole stretch. And, and we do, we are trying to adjust them to root cutting and cleaning. Um, but it's, it's not the pipe on that street itself. It's the downstream pipe. That's the problem. I did see the right, and it was bad. Yes. Yeah. yeah. I, I'm just giving you up because I'm sure, like I said, I'm not going to be the last one to complain about it because there, there, there is a lot of upset people. Because that carried across Cooperstown Road and then continued on Hickory, on Hickory, yeah. uh, towards the Walnut Street School. That that's how bad it was flooded here today. And like I said, when you get a chance, just take a look at them pictures. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you. You're welcome. Is, Harry, is that in our uh, and Richard? Isn't that one of the projects that we're addressing in our bond or no? I mean, that's come up every year because last year the water was knee deep there. Mm -hmm. My car just about got stuck there coming home from a township committee meeting one night last year. Yeah, it, no, it is it, without question bad. Um, yes, we have uh, funds to, to video the pipe and see where the problems are. Um, and then after that, we'll, we'd have to come up with funds to actually repair those issues. Um, and it's, it's, going to be it could be, it could be somewhat expensive but we don't know until we video the pipe um, right the, the big problem are, are tree roots um, throughout that whole system at the poplar um, I know it's loaded with tree roots and we, we've been I think uh, I'm gonna say 10 years ago or so they were cleaned out at one time um, but nothing's been done since so are we going to move forward with at least doing the the look are we going to do that this year soon yes yes okay good thank you you're welcome any other questions or comments from the public this is session two anything in the chat mrs lord yeah uh, mayor yes we have a, a comment a question in the chat from uh, Vera Dormo, has the New Jersey Cannabis Control Commission put the guidelines and regu uh, regulations yet? Have they set those guidelines and regulations yet? No, they have not. Uh, they have not been established. I wanted to Go ahead, Doug. bring up, I'm sorry, Mayor, um, that has not come out yet. There's some anticipation it may happen in August, uh, but nothing definite yet. I believe the CRC has to establish uh, regulations. Uh, it was the same date as the opt-in, opt-out date, uh, August 21st. And uh, I believe the CRC has a, has a public meeting tomorrow uh, via Zoom if, for those that may be interested. And any other comments, Mrs. Lord? A comment just popped up. Yes, we have, um, it's not identified, it's just from Galaxy Note 20. Um, oh, hello, my name is Patrick Porter and I just recently pur purchased a lot in Delran. Disregard, I'm sorry, I didn't read the whole thing. It's not nothing for. All right, 
this, this All right, I'll close this uh, session two. Closed is now closed to the public. Uh, status of coronavirus disease uh, and executive orders. Um, I start off with you, Mrs. Laurel, on the, the building status and uh, where we are as far as public and masks and, uh, and so forth. Yes, the, the, the building is open five days a week now. Everyone has returned full time to work. Um, with their regular schedules. We have uh, the policy, the signs have been changed to um, implement the new policy that uh, masks are recommended for um, those who have not been vaccinated. Um, masks and social distancing for those that have not been vaccinated for COVID-19. And that's the status of the building. All right, uh, and the county is still conducting uh, county testing at the various sites, uh, which is on the county website and vaccines are pretty much available at uh, most commercial uh, pharmacies, CBS, Walgreens and, and so forth and some of the larger uh, uh, chains uh, uh, and so forth. So the vaccines are out there. Burlington County is uh, one of the higher uh, vaccination rates in the state, which is a good thing. Um, uh, there's a lot of concern on the D variant uh, as you may or may not know, I travel a lot overseas, and uh, one of the countries I go to is now heading in the opposite directions and reinstituting restrictions that they just relaxed uh, two, three weeks ago. So, um, uh, a, a bit of caution uh, going forward, but uh, get that vaccine and uh, and uh, let's to take care of us, take care of ourselves as a community. Uh, let's see. So you have to decide, verify about your next meeting? Yeah, I think we had talked about uh, being back in the room for the, uh, was it August 2nd? Yes. Mm -hmm. If everybody still, still agrees they want to do August 2nd versus wait till September 13th, for example. Have the, um, have, have the um, partitions been removed yet? Yes, the room has been set back to, um, these the chairs all in line with the gang seating and the partitions have all been removed. So there is, um, you know, no provisions for social distancing or separation by partition. It, um, it's back to pre-COVID form. Is everyone in the committee uh, in agreement with that 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 configuration or? Um, going forward with a public in the room uh, meeting on August 2nd, or, or do you want to uh, push that into September? I'm ready to go back in. And just, just uh, um, the room is not compatible for a hybrid, um, offering it both in person and via Zoom. Um, we did try that at the very beginning of the COVID and it was a disaster. So uh, the room, it does not accommodate our acoustics as well as our sound system, does not accommodate the ability to have both a virtual and a uh, in-person format. Um, we are looking into and having some companies come out to get, give us proposals and mm -hmm. quotes um, for uh, what technologies and acoustical work mm -hmm. is needed to um, be able to provide uh, the virtual as well as the in-person platform. So something that we may want to look at is, you know, if, if we still like this, this format that we get much more participation from the public alternating uh, within the month, you know, maybe first meeting of the month on Zoom, second meeting of the month in person or whatever. So the, just some different ideas, um, as long as the COVID status quo remains as it is or better. So. Uh, but uh, so we're all a go for August 2nd in the room. I'd prefer to wait till September. Uh, I, I wanted to ask Richard uh, what his feeling was on it uh, and Janice, since there are two administrators there. Um, I mean, I, I'm ready to go back in the meeting as well, but um, the other organizations that are meeting in town, um, sewer, seniors, uh, history board. The only one I know that's been meeting in the uh, recreation has continued to meet in 
in at town hall and um that's the only one that i know of that's met at town hall so, advisory commission did oh did you okay so i really wanted to know how, what the administration felt uh i mean i'm ready to go back in but um the two of you kind of run the show for us and i kind of like your opinions yeah i obviously personally it's easier for me to do this and i see the kind of uh response you get from the public and you seem to have no problem having your communications but uh because our room is not a very good room for communicating uh so that having nothing directly to do with covid there is some positive to this format. Uh, on the other hand, if uh, what's if you feel otherwise that uh, you know people will um, be able to get things accomplished better and do things together better in the room, then we should do that. You can have the in person, and you may or may not get negative feedback from those who. Uh, will now not be able to uh, attend. So you can see how that is while Janice is working on getting proposals for hybrid, which would be the ideal. I don't think that uh, we'll have anything for hybrid before the end of the year. Uh, so that if you're gonna do this, if you wait till September, it's only in case the world changes a little bit with the Delta variants. And you've only got one, perhaps two, if you do two meetings in August, so that it, it is the summer and it may be that uh, it might make more sense to uh, wait till the September 13th meeting from that perspective. But if the five of you are ready to go, you know, we're fine. It's your meeting. Uh, Chris, you have a comment on this? Yeah, I don't, I don't have much of an opinion either way. I kind of prefer to stay, to stay remote till September, but, uh, but only because I really enjoy having so many people from town on the calls like there was no one in our public meetings when we were when we're in the building so i think that we're gonna we're gonna feel a loss after a year year and a half of so much participation and and what carries on onto facebook then um, as a result of our meeting so um i i'd like to stay on this format as long as possible but i'm i'm ready when you guys are And John, John, you wanted to uh, get back in the room and go back to normal. And Fern, you want it? I want to wait till September. Uh, again, the participation that we have with the uh, residents or from the residents being part of our meetings. Uh, here we are, you know, again, we're in the summer months uh, I, for our professionals and for the staff. You know, being able to do this from home, you know, uh, I just think it's a it's a good format that we have. But if the majority of the folks want to go into the into the hall, then I guess we go back into town hall and we'll do it. Kate, um, I I think we ought to finish out the summer on Zoom. Uh, people are on vacations or what have you, and they still have the opportunity to call in and. Um, I think September would be fine to wait till then. And I think the other the other thing I wanted to ask uh, Janice and Richard, um, are we also improving the actual acoustics in town hall? I mean, we're moving forward with that right off the bat, right? I mean, well, that that that's all one. Without all changing one. the acoustics, it seems like it'll be impossible to okay. do the hybrid. So we built that into the. So it's an alternative. It's, it's, it's into the what Janice is talking to people about uh, the chance of being able to do it without improving the acoustics, which will carry on to the in, in person meetings. Anyhow, we okay. knew we were going to do that, whether we spend the extra money to also upgrade the uh, sound system so that uh, it will work through a zoom type format, whether it's zoom or or a more high end thing. Janice will be able to give you more details as she gets these proposals, but she's talked to many, many other municipalities and how they're working it. And it's a very hit and miss kind of thing. It's a whole new thing for us. We're not experts at it. And uh, so we've got a lot to learn. So it'll take a little bit of time to do it right rather than just jump in. 
Good. Thank you. Well, let's uh, let's stay on Zoom and look uh, right now. Playing on the uh, September thirteenth as our first uh, in the room in person uh, uh, meeting. Okay. It's yes. Thank you. Because the one thing is based on your decision, then if you were to come back in person, then I have to do a series of publications um, saying that the meetings will now be back in the municipal building only. So at this point, then I will not, um, the August meeting or meetings will continue Zoom if I understand correctly. Yeah, let's, let's uh, yeah, Zoom and uh, in person in the room on September 13th, uh, we'll pencil that in. Uh, <laughs> as that unless uh, hopefully things will stay the way they are get better so sorry john sorry john mayor, mayor just to add to that um we might want to make it clear to the other entities in town whether uh that's going to be the policy town wide or whether we're going to defer to each entity for example particularly the joint land use board on when they return to uh in-person meetings i I don't know if if the committee feels that once once we do, everyone should or uh, and that that's particularly important with joint land use board because of the notice provisions that lead up to meetings. You really you really have the land use board really has to get back in that room if anybody okay and. Um, I can't believe we're taking this much time talking about it, I understand you want uh, zoom. Uh, for participation, but the rest of the world has moved on. Okay, everywhere I went on vacation, nobody had a mask. My store no longer has a mask mandate or um, a plexiglass. This is the only place in my life I'm getting hung up with this COVID thing is my township committee. Now for the folks who say, well, it's easy, it's easy. Sorry, but you know, for uh, 240 years, people have been going to meeting halls and uh, I keep getting cut off the internet um, and it's annoying when I, I, I miss things during the meeting. So you guys want to go, you know, keep hanging on to this. Go ahead. I'm, I'm done with it. I'm done. Now the new uh, the COVID variant going to scare everybody again. Another lockdown. Come on. Be done with it. Be done. Let's move on. All right. That's my set. Thank you. Thank you, John. All right. Uh, correspondence, Mrs. Lorp. Well, Doug's, did you answer Doug's question about is this the rule for everybody or does each group get to make its own decision? The, the building is open so that each group can make its own decision as far as I understand that, that yeah. it's each group's own judgment. Yeah. Well, that's how it's been. Uh, Fern, you had your hand up? Well, I was going to ask Ms. Martin, uh, do we have anything on the Joint Land Use Board agenda for August? Uh, well, tomorrow is the deadline for applications. Uh, so as of right now, I do not have anything. Uh, the board members had asked that I poll them by email, asking what people would prefer. Um, I've only received responses from five out of the 10 people. Mrs. Lohr said whatever <laughs> I would like to do is what her answer will be. Um, but so far, they are interested in going back into the courtroom. So, but we may not have to have an August meeting because I may not have any applications. So we could also wait until September. I mean, I, I don't think what, what the committee does, I mean, yeah. the, the court and the planning board have the most restrictive uh, um, accommodations as far as uh, uh, COVID and recording and, and all that stuff. So uh, they're way at, at that end of the scale. So they've got the, the most the most limits to work with uh, in, in their situation. So I don't, I don't know that what we do or don't do should apply to them or, or limit them on what they can do. So yeah. they have permission to make their own decision. Yeah. yeah. Each group each group can make its own decision. Okay. Yeah. I, I agree with that approach. Uh, not every governing body feels the same way and they feel like once they set the policy, everybody else should follow. So I just want to make it clear so that everybody knows how they're 
operating in response to that. And um, the only other thing I'll add is as we move into the future and talk about potentially doing um, dual platform meetings in person and, and Zoom, um, the Joint Land Use Board has, in my opinion, that's the area that's most fraught with legal issues. So as we get to that point, we'll have to coordinate and, and I'll talk to Lou about those issues in advance so that we can try and address them as best as possible. All right. Uh, uh, Mr. Hyde, comment? I have a question uh, pertaining to recordings in the, uh, of the township meetings in town hall. Uh, I thought at one point uh, the public was not allowed to or permitted to record our meetings inside the building. So somebody from the public can hold up their phone or a, a camera and, and record as long as they're not disrupting the meeting. Um, some towns have gone as far as to pass ordinances to regulate that conduct in a meeting room, but I don't think we've experienced that to the point where it's been an issue to warrant an ordinance. So oh, no. uh, you can't, somebody, I know, it, for example, in Mount Holly, there's a resident who comes to every meeting and holds up their phone and, and uh -huh. hits record. Okay. Thank you. Anything else to correspond with Mrs. Lohr? No, but Mayor, we do have a couple um, comments in the, <clears throat> excuse me, chat section that came in after the meeting was closed to the public. I think one person was having some technical diff difficulty, but did get their comment in. Um, we also have uh, Mrs. Dorma requesting that we stay Zoom. <laughs> so, but the other one that Pat Patrick Porter is uh, writing that he purchased a lot in Delanco, um, 316 Rancocas Avenue. He recently installed a split rail fence and uh, put PVC coated black wire behind it. And he's being told he has to take it down. And, um, you know, uh, the, his comments go on to say that he's got small children and dogs and he would, does not understand why he has to take down the split rail. Um, and he feels that it has uh, been constructed according to code. So, but I would defer that to the zoning officer. Um, I'm yeah. not, again, this is just coming in. Yeah. So I don't know the background on this uh, to be able to comment on this at this time. The uh, fence ordinance that we did, um, I don't know, maybe 2016, if anybody remembers when the people along Delaware Avenue, the waterfront properties, uh, wanted to be able to install fences in order to protect their private areas because uh, people were camping out, not camping out overnight, but they were picnicking and walking on their properties. So we did amend the fence ordinance mm -hmm. to allow them to put uh, a fence up. I think it's three and a half feet. Post could be four feet. And there were four types of fences, if I'm not mistaken, uh, split rail, um, vinyl, PVC, um, some, some designation regarding the actual gate, maybe six mm -hmm. foot or something. But, um, and the purpose of the open, it, they had to be open uh, for water flow. Mm -hmm. If you remember, um, so that a wire fence wasn't allowed. Wire was one of the uh, items that was not on that permitted use in our ordinance. And um, no one along any waterfront properties who has put fences up have put wire behind them. Mm -hmm. So, um, I mean, that's our ordinance. That's the way it reads. Well, I'll, I'll check with the zoning officer on this to, to see if um, there's even a zoning permit and a fence permit. That's the first thing. Yeah, yeah. And um, take it from yeah. there. Yeah. Okay. All right. We'll look into that. Thank you. Mm -hmm. All right. Uh, discussion items. We've got a bunch of them. Uh, number one, status of solid waste collection delays. Our favorite topic for the last two months. <sighs> Any news updates? Uh, it looked like things got taken care of last latter half of Thursday and into Friday, correct? And Saturday. So this they past did. week and they Saturday. Did, yeah. Okay. 
Yeah. And uh, the county recycle was making the rounds on Thursday, yep. I saw. Um, and I guess uh, we're still week to week on, on this. Um, the, the county has said that the schedules have gone back to normal. So we anticipate it to be back on that every other Thursday schedule for recycling. The um, solid waste collection, your trash collection is still on a, we don't know until that Thursday morning. Uh, so uh, because of the shortage of um, laborers, drivers, the holidays, temperatures all affect the call in. Um, sometimes it's just that the workers call out. They call out and they cannot get enough people on the trucks to man the trucks. So, um, but they have been, um, we've been pushing them that, you know, if it, not to delay it, and if there is going to be a delay to get in town the next day, um, not ne the next week. We also have been in, um, encouraging that we don't, we are not part of the, the domino effect that if one of the other towns um, is delayed or not picked up that that just bumps everybody else and bumps Delanco back. Our day is Thursday and we'd like to keep that schedule regardless of what's happening on other days with other towns. So um, it's been a collective effort <laughs> and, and monitoring and communicating um, with the company, with the owner, uh, looking at the trucks, going around town, spotting trucks, um, what areas of town aren't done, um, and emailing them to say, hey, this, you know, this section of town's not done, that section of town's not done. It's already three in the afternoon, four in the afternoon. What's your plan? So, um, and we assume that will continue for um, hopefully not too much longer, but um, it, it probably will continue, particularly with the high temperatures, the, the, the summer months and the 90 degree and humidity. Um, it, and we're a Thursday, so we're more towards the end of the week. And the guys, um, the, the throwers, particularly the throwers, get pretty wrung out, throwing heat Monday, Tuesday into Wednesday in 90 plus degree heat. By Thursday, they're calling out. We're, we're, having, we're experiencing that also. All right. Uh, first of all, my thanks to you and Mrs. Martin and Mrs. Russell and Mr. Olette for um, being the trash wranglers and, and doing the, the drive arounds to find the trucks and find uh, the streets that have been missed or, or the addresses that, that have been missed. It's, that's been a lot of work and, and uh, getting, uh, keeping the, uh, the website updated and uh, uh, the message board out front updated. So, uh, Appreciate the good, the good extra effort as always on that. Um, going forward, you know, right now this contract we're we're partnered with Edgewater and Beverly, and uh, we'll be getting, I guess, uh, uh, talking with them on on how we proceed uh, either as a group or individually. Uh, so uh, going forward, this uh, continues to be a problem. So I guess I think that's all I can say about that right now. But we'll keep after it. Any comments from the committee on the, on the, the trash situation uh, before we move on? On the current uh, situation that we're dealing with, uh, I guess I have to feel fortunate and uh, thankful that we're getting picked up on a weekly basis, even though we're getting the, the delay. Uh, as far as the future with our, our, our trash ordinances and, and taking a look at those, uh, we had tried to set up uh, a couple of dates as far as the subcommittee and because of vacations and things that were going on. Uh, so I'm looking forward over the, the next few weeks to get together with the subcommittee uh, to start the work on uh, taking a look at our trash ordinances. And as, as has been put out by the administration or the township, uh, uh, as far as uh, putting out bulk items, if there's a way you can not do that and hold it, uh, if we, we do get uh, limited on the number of tr uh, trash trucks that uh, come to Delanco on a Thursday, um, if you're putting out a sofa or a mattress or furniture or any you know, bulky item, that's knocking out capacity for the rest of your neighbors down, down the end of the street. And if we uh, 
the truck uh, bulks out, fills up and takes off for the uh, landfill and doesn't come back, then those cans uh, and your neighbor's trash get to sit out for uh, a couple days potentially or more. So if you, if you can hang on to those bulk items uh, for a better day, uh, and uh, certainly uh, after the summer heat, uh, you know, that's the real big thing that the perishables and things that are gonna uh, smell and attract uh, vermin and things like that, we need to get that up off the street and uh, properly disposed of, so. All right, uh, let's see, item two, propose no stopping standing vehicular regulations for Creek Road. Uh, Chief Sano, I think this is yours. Yes, sir. Uh, I'll start off with the goal of the objective. The objective is to prohibit parking along Creek Road. And then I will give you the background along that. The, uh, the Creek Road that I'm speaking of is the uh, County Route uh, 625, which runs from the Township Line Edgewood Park, the Lanco Township line in the area, the skating rink all the way, and including the bypass, the new bypass up until Cooperstown Road. Uh, it started with a business reaching out to me. They were going to have a, um, an event, a hiring event, uh, a business on Creek Road, and they wanted permission to park vehicles uh, on Shoulder Creek Road during this two-day event. And um, I uh, looked into the code and saw that there was nothing prohibiting it, that actually there is no uh, ordinance that stops vehicles from parking on Creek Road, regardless of size. But I expressed my concern because, um, you know, I have learned from the county that when I wanted to allow parking in front of River's Edge to try to relieve some of the congestion that we have in there, I was told, no, I can't do that because of the speed limit. And I know the speed limit is much faster and set higher on Creek Road than it is on Burlington Avenue. It's 40 where I want to do it and it's 45 on Creek Road. So I reached out to the county because of this request and asked them if they had anything on their uh, code that you know, permits or allows vehicles to park or prohibits either one. And I was informed, no, there's nothing on their books but the engineer uh, did look at it, look at it, and recommend that the vehicle should be parked there. Uh, it's not uh, safe because of the sight lines and, and the current speed limit. And then uh, in the interim, the county park uh, ranger reached out to me and informed me that they're uh, tired of moving and chasing uh, trucks from uh, the businesses on Creek Road parking in front of the uh, the park. So. Now I had a, uh, a friend in the county parks. So uh, I approached Joe Prickley and, um, and you know, asked them if we could uh, discuss this because the last time we entered into this venture of passing ordinance, we were on the hook for paying for and installing all these new parking signs when it's obvious that the uh, county has interest both engineering wise and both uh, you know, uh, entity uh, not wanting the same thing, not parking, allowing on uh, Creek Road. So I got in discussion with him and uh, Mr. Smith, John Smith, the superintendent of the county uh, parks. He was on the phone call as well. And he, uh, he, like I said, he supported the whole idea because tractor and trailers are uh, parking before or after that park entrance and it's obstructing the view. And there's no real way to um, enforce that because there's there's no uh, ordinance that pre prevents it. So Mr. Brickley, um, he, uh, I guess he was in a good mood that day and he agreed that if we went ahead and passed the ordinance and we did the same process we did for Cooper Town Road and we forwarded to them with a sketch from the, our township engineer that they would in kind pass uh, whatever they needed to pass and parking would be prohibited on Creek Road the entire length that I suggested and they're in agreement for that length. Uh, and we came up with the same idea that Mr. Schwab has suggested that we target uh, certain areas with signage and not litter Creek Road with signage and only address areas where we, you know, we notice it's a problem. So the immediate area would be um, the park area on Creek Road and across the street, Carvana uh, seems to be um, 
they're the ones who want to start having their employees park on the public street instead of our parking lot. And uh, also they have truck carriers, which apparently are parking uh, on Creek Road. So that's how we got to this point. I did tell Mr. Brickley that uh, there might be some interest from the recreation to also have signs in front of the Field of Dreams. So he was open to that. And then anything beyond this initial purchase and installation, then it would be a joint venture between the county and the township on any areas that we find that we need additional signage, uh, meaning that we would get into negotiations and see if we go half and half or, or they do the installation, we pay for the signs. But um, like I said, this is just a limited uh, time for them taking the, uh, taking the cost. Um, so that's the reason for the ordinance. Uh, you can shoot your questions. And I don't know if uh, Phil is on the on the line or if he has a, uh, a desire to make that area in front of Field of Dreams, uh, you know, put some no parking signs there. And I just figured that would help uh, deter any trucks from being in the area. They see no parking. They see the you know five tons, uh, no vehicles beyond five tons on this road would you know help preserve that uh, newly. Uh, renovated parking lot. So that's the uh, that's the goal, and um, and uh, you know I could use Doug's um, help in terms of how identify Creek Road. Should we just refer to as the county route, since the old Creek Road is now the um, is the right of way of the township, and we could could we just simply say, you know, county route six twenty five, no parking both sides. Well. Do you want to do that for full both sides and only sign certain portions? Yes. Okay. So let's, we'll work on the draft. We'll get it resolved, but um, we'll, we'll try and describe it as best as we possible based upon what facts we have. Yeah, I, we only had a one-time issue with motor vehicle, but when they re reopened in uh, June of 2020, it was, um, you know, it was, it was crazy. They were parking on Long Creek Road, running across Creek Road to get, you know, but, you know, since then, that was, I think, a hopefully a once in a lifetime thing. Right. That, because uh, they reopened and they were closed so long that I don't think they'll ever experience that uh, overflow again. But if they do, then, you know, we, we uh, you know, we were prepared. And the county did offer this business um, a um, an event permit, meaning that um, if they came up with a traffic plan and engineer, they would be permitted to utilize a portion of Creek Road, but they decided to, I uh, guess, go with plan B and rearrange their inventory and make room for their employees to park so their visitors can have an area to park. I would think you'd want to also include the frontage, you know, as you say, at, at the Field of Dreams, you know, if you're, if you're going to have designated uh, no parking on, on the north side of, of the road there, then it's just, you're just going to end up with spillover uh, to, uh, you know, in front of the frontage at the Field of Dreams. So it would seem yeah. prudent to have that, that all parking barred along that whole, whole mm -hmm. length there. Yeah, I mean, I I told Mr. Berkeley that uh, you know I I had a feeling that that would be desired, and I prepared him saying you know there there's you know maybe one additional spot because he didn't want to give away the store you know, but um, so I told him there could be potentially just you know one more spot that we want to address right away because like you said um, you know, unintended consequences, then they're going to go you know another quarter mile down the road and park. Yeah, keep, know, just hey, Jesse. Yes, Phil. This is Phil McFadden, 410 Maple. Uh, yeah, the Recreation Commission would be on board to keep in consistence with the no parking on the Pennington Park area and along the Creek Road. So I wouldn't see why we wouldn't want the signs out there. Okay. Is everybody okay, you know, getting the language and introducing the ordinance? And I can tell Mr. Berkeley that we're moving forward and the two target areas that we want. Yes, 
Yeah, yeah sounds yes. good. Uh, yeah, just, uh, you know, as, as that draft is going back and forth, just uh, copy for info, uh, recreation and, uh, and the county parks, just that uh, something doesn't get too far along that someone sees a problem with it. Okay. Yeah, the county parks, Stephen said they would, they told Burke, Joe, Mr. Berkeley, that they would put up their own signs. So that's how they're fast. They want this done. So yeah, I had, a, I had a good enthusiastic partner in this one. So I think maybe that's why Mr. Berkeley was so accommodating. And you made some new friends. Well, for the time being. <laughs> time being. All right, good. All right, so we got that taken care of. Uh, item three, subcommittee formation for cannabis zoning and lane. Excuse me, if I, if I can interrupt you, I, I got a phone call from uh, John Fenimore uh, indicating he was going home to try to pump out his own flooded basement and noted that uh, the Babe Ruth Field is acting as the town's entire uh, detention basin since uh, we're about waist deep there. And uh, hopefully it'll drain off by tomorrow, but the entire field is, is totally flooded. He's blocked off as many streets as he can, and they're retiring for the night unless they get called out again, pump their own basements. All right. Thought Everyone I'd be you. careful. Yeah, thank be you. Careful. Sorry. Okay, jumping. sorry. No, no, no. <clears throat> uh, item three, subcommittee formation for cannabis zoning and land use study. Uh, uh, we've talked a little bit about this last, last meeting, and it kind of went in a couple different directions there and it wasn't clear in my head uh, as far as the, the, the scope of what we wanted uh, uh, and how uh, I think I proposed uh, sending a letter similar to the uh, the bridge commission the the, um, the route 130 corridor plan uh, sending a letter of interest uh, to the various boards and commission chairman to solicit a volunteer. And then uh, talking with some people uh, in town uh, over the last uh, two, three weeks since that meeting, um, was inquiring of other you know, uh, neighbors in town and residents uh, if, if there was an interest there. So uh, before I got too far out in front of everything, uh, wanted to see what the committee wanted as far as uh, the scope of what uh, they would look into. Um, if, uh, as far as research, looking into, you know, keep, keeping it limited to just a, a zoning issue or um, uh, um, ordinances as far as managing it, if, uh, things like that, um, and uh, just basic number, how many people, you know, want to, you know, uh, have it too large that it's unmanageable, but uh, whether we want uh, six people, 10 people, uh, uh, volunteers on that. So, that's what I wanted to uh, ask you about uh, this evening. Well, actually, I thought we were pretty clear at the last meeting um, that it would be Christine and I from the Township Committee, that we would have two members from the Joint Land Use Board, that we would have um, two members from the public and John Brown and I both recommended Matt Bartlett as one of them because the public had so much input. They had uh, input as to uh, no, as to yes. So, uh, and um, Environmental Advisory Board had made some um, comments. Uh, we thought it was, uh, it had at least one member from there and um, I think that was pretty much what we discussed. It was actually very similar to the committee that you've already set up, if I'm not mistaken. And I believe that I, I you know, I'm pretty sure that it would actually have everybody that you have on the subcommittee you set up for the state planning um, commission response that you had to do. I thought that was the state planning commission's response that you're working on that you set yes. up that subcommittee. Yes. Okay. So I thought it was going to be very similar. So right now we have three members that uh, Matt, Christine, and myself, and um, we would like the other members to come forward. Um, and we thought you were doing the, you and Janice were getting together to send out the email. 
Yeah, we had talked about that. And I guess in my mind, it, it, uh, I was still unclear on some things. So before I got out, got too far out in front of things, I wanted to bring that up again and just to uh, make sure uh, what I recollect or the fuzziness of what I recollected was correct and, and didn't uh, put it. So we're looking at a group of, let's see, two, four, four, six. Seven, I think. Seven. I think the economic advisory yeah. board was thought you were going to get a rep from that. Oh, okay. Yeah, that's right. I missed that one. Econ. All right. So also EAB. Right. So EAB. That. One, two, three, four, five, six, eight. Well, non-citizen rate, meaning that's six. Uh, K, K, Christine, two joint land use board. Right. One EAB, one economic. That's six. Right. And then general citizen Ray, you know, right. I don't know if you want one, two, three, two. Many are interested. You know. All right. Well, the thing is, you don't want a committee that's too, like Mike had indicated, you don't want a committee that's too big that you can't make any decisions. Or, well, or, and, um, and it, it becomes a scheduling issue too, you know, trying yes. to get. So get, let's keep it at seven, no more than eight. All right. We'll cap it. Let's cap it at eight. And uh, I'll see what uh, who I can get from planning board and the names from econ and EAB. And you got the two planning. Oh, okay. All right. Any other comments on that? And, and as far as as far as the scope, just strictly location, 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 and the five uh uses or do you want it to, uh, you want a broader look at things well there's six uses i believe and um but i think we don't have yeah, the but, in number six exactly but six i mean uh location but also um why we would recommend it if we would and what would we recommend and where so we'd have to come up with the zoning area mm -hmm. and um and a suggestion as to what the subcommittee would recommend, if any. Okay. Use or no use. And a time frame for a uh, a result or, re or a report. Well, I think we have to get the committee set up first and at least have a meeting. Maybe then we can report to you what our time frame right. would be. Okay. I'm just uh, asking for some some boundaries here to work with. All right. Very good. Before Any we move on for comments, that, Rads? real quick, Mike, on that, um, there's legislation knocking around to try and push back this August deadline uh, from August 21st for another 60 days. Whether that'll pass, I have no idea, and certainly nothing that uh, I think towns can rely upon, but I think it shows the frustration that some of the towns, us included, have with the, the deadline that was given versus when the state regulations are coming out. And um, the only other comment I have is that um, I do think that it would be good to include Taylor design somewhere in that process with the subcommittee. Um, if you get to a point where you're talking about appropriate uses and appropriate areas, just to, to get their input on, on what the thinking is and get some feedback from them before it gets too far along. That's good. One of the comments um, that just came across from Vera was how can we even set up a subcommittee and do anything without the state regulations and guidelines? And that's really an important issue. Yeah. Yep. So, All true. So maybe it'll it'll come together 60 or 90 days out. So that we'll have there'll be something that's solid enough to work with. So and, and you, you uh, I'll just echo what Doug said. You do need some professional input um, in that uh, as you look at various options, whether it's uh, and understand zoning, per, whether it's a permitted use, an overlay, a conditional use. There's w different ways to to um, address and zone for um, you know the, the different cannabis uses. Some towns are doing overlays. Some are doing conditional use. Some are doing straight permitted use. So um, you want to have someone with that technical expertise to guide that along. 
Yeah, I've been looking at the some of the zoning ordinances in various towns and states uh, um, that have had to legal legalize cannabis over, over the years or recently, and uh, quite complex and uh, really very very narrowly focused um, specific lots within a specific plot within a specific zone um, and. Uh, various uh, Venn diagrams of arcs and radiuses that it cannot be encroached upon schools or churches or residential areas, all kinds of things. So it's an incredibly complex process and it's very helpful to look at uh, other communities that have uh, a couple of years experience um, and uh, talk to them and see what, uh, learn from there, uh, what worked for them and what didn't work. So. All right, moving on. Uh, number four, status of building and property 200 ash. Uh, time favorite that, that we're coming back to. Um, the canvas shop. Um, what are we doing? Where are we going? Is that uh, um, the intent to retain it as a recreation, municipal recreation open space? Let's start with that, just uh, with, with the land. Is that what, what we want? Is that what's important for the community going forward? And the alternative, if we don't do that, then whatever other use it would, it would become. Is that what we want? Uh, want that piece of property to go to? John? Harry, I want Harry to comment on 200 Ash since it was on his report about the asbestos. Um, I have not seen that report yet. What, uh, is that what we're waiting on, Harry? No, no, no. The, the asbestos um, is actually pretty minimal in, in that building. Uh, and that would be taken care of. If, if it was demoed, that would be take, taken care of during the demolition process. Okay. Well, I, I really think we need to consider demolishing the building, um, you know, first and foremost, for safety precautions. Um, where are we at? I mean, what's everybody think? I don't want this just to get buried for 20 years. And, you know, after I'm dead and gone, I come back as a ghost and I still see it and it gives me a place to hang out. <laughs> are you writing a story, John? Pardon me? You're writing a story? <laughs> <laughs> but uh, I, I just, you know, lost track of the, the process here, uh, with, you know, our budget season and, you know, everything else going on with COVID and, you know, it is a capital improvement for the town. I have seen it as a, a nice park right in between the two bridges with a beautiful vista of either bridge or upstream or, uh, you know, sunset downstream. Um, so what, uh, where are we at? I, I think if I could, um, I know that it's, it's deteriorating, uh, you know, as we speak, uh, there's, there's a window missing now that I, I'm not sure if John had time to get, get to fixing that up. Um, and the longer we wait, the more unsafe it's becoming. Um, so I think your first decision really is, do you want to try and keep it and keep it safe and then restore it? Or do you want to demo the building? The, no, the I, afterwards can be decided at, at pretty much any time. I, I think restoring it is just out of the question. Just would be a money pit. Uh, and if it's still, you know, if it's a building left standing there, I, I think, you know, developers are going to continue to try to come after it, especially with the other two parcels next door to it, uh, would be a good redevelopment uh, potential. So I think if we were to preserve it as a park, we take that off the table. Right. I, I thought that was our intention when we um, decided to purchase it, that it would be kept for open space, a, a park. I yeah. looked into um, Camden County had restored uh, an old building into a boathouse. And um, I contacted Camden County officials on more than one occasion to talk to somebody to see how they did it because it was an in, it was done by an individual it was millions of dollars that they spent um and of course none of the um people from camden ever got back to me um this building doesn't have the same potential that the other building had in camden um and at this point i don't know that 
there is any restoration and what would the purpose be? Um, we could not, I don't believe that we could afford to restore it any more than we could have afforded to maintain and restore the Zerbrook mansion. Um, so to me, I, I mean, we don't have millions to put into that building. No. So it probably would be more of an asset to us if it were demolished. And if we could then partner with either Rancocas, um, Greenway, um, John Anderson, who does the kayaking and what have you, and maybe the county, once the building is gone, would work with us to have the park and assist in any small development that we would be able to put there. Um, is it, would it have to go Green Acres? I think any open space in Delanco, once you're on that Rossi list, goes Green Acres. Okay, so uh, by so default, it's an automatic. Yeah, by default, it ends up uh, being considered green acre property. Um, so what I'm hearing, uh, and really for the first time, is that we're in agreement uh, that we're preserving the land as open space and and future parkland. Is that correct? That's where yeah. my mind is at. It yeah, seems I'm to be to... our only feasible answer when you think okay. about it. We right. just don't have the money. Chris? And no one else has agreed to come in with us. No, nope, I agree. All right. I don't think that we need to be in the business of restoring that. So uh, do we, would it be fair in, in the interest of uh, openness and public information that we advertise that we'll make a decision on the building itself at uh, say a September meeting? and make a decision at that time, a final decision as to what to do with it. And that people can come and, and speak their minds uh, one way or the other about the building. I think it's, uh, you know, there's, there has been some uh, off times, uh, uh, the, the dream that that building could be restored or converted into some kind of community space. Um, as Mr. Fox has mentioned and Ms. Fitzpatrick has mentioned, oh. those are extraordinarily expensive propositions. And then you're looking at the, after you're done year over year maintenance and sustaining it. So uh, whether this community would be able to support that without uh, financially killing ourselves. Agreed or any I guess other? in fairness to the public, I mean, we've given them We've had this on our agenda at least since January. Uh, yeah. Uh, making this decision, we've made the decision. Uh, you know, for me, if somebody came in with a checkbook to help write uh, making the park it, or converting it to uh, a boat house, or uh, you know, that'd be one thing where they're going to write the check and uh, the community is still uh, benefit from it. Uh, but uh, I, I guess in fairness, I think we've done our due diligence and we've made that decision. Do you want to hold off till the August and uh, allow the public another 30 days to uh, chime in on this? Uh, so be it. I don't think the end of the world is going to happen if, if we don't do that uh, for 30 days or again, you said uh, September's meeting that pushes it off almost 60 days. Uh, I don't think uh, I'm not a professional and I have to uh, defer back to Mr. Fox, but you know, the building's not going to come crashing down on us in, in the next 60 days. Uh, so either way, whether we make a decision tonight or we end up uh, waiting uh, till August or September, uh, I don't think my mind is going to change any. Richard, did we uh, budget for the demolition? Yes. Yes, we did. And Harry gave us a proposal. We could have him look at it, update it, make sure that it's still good. And you put a mm -hmm. timetable together for us and you put on the agenda for the September 13th meeting. And that's where you're going to vote to, uh, 
approve the final, the engineer's proposal and timetable and authorize and write specs for demolition, then that would be your action. You yeah. have a deadline and, and you could make that not on the consent agenda, but separately. And if you want to take comment, then, that would be the item. And then in the meantime, Rec can uh, start playing in a park. <laughs> And then the uh, uh, the remediation of the of the the ground uh, would follow the uh, uh, demolition. If we went that direction, correct? Right. Yeah. Right. That, that's separate. You got the demolition, the asbestos is part of it. Yeah. The use of it later on will still require either getting rid of soil or covering it over and inspecting it annually. Those two all options that yeah. that they gave us as to how to deal with it. Right. But right now is the question of should the building be there or not. You don't have to make any final decisions on the land. It's a question of the building. Right. Sounds good to me. So is everyone okay? We'll uh, we'll make a final uh, determination at the first uh, September meeting. Yes. Yes. Sure. All right, uh, Mr. Fox. Uh, question on uh, in the demolition process. Uh, I guess in one of the walkthroughs, there was comments made about the beams that are in there and they might be of value to someone. Uh, and I'm thinking that if it's of value to someone, uh, you know, is that something that could be sold off or? There's, there's two, well, a couple of ways of doing it. Um, generally, if they're worth anything, the contractor puts that into his bid um, because he's going to sell it off. Uh, and generally, you're talking steel and, and, and metals that they're, that they're worried about. The beams, I don't think the contractor's going to want. But to have them alter their, their demolition um, process by saving certain materials is certainly going to raise your cost. Um, so that, that's a call. If, if you, it, you know, it can be done, but it's, it's going to you know, be a cost to it to, for a contractor to, to save certain parts. No, I'd only be willing to do that if, if someone was interested in uh, wanting the beams or uh, any of the lumber in there, that they would foot that that expense of, uh, I guess, saving it, that it material. It would be difficult because you, you pretty much have to put that into the original bid package that you're saving X, Y, or Z. So everybody's bidding on the same thing. Um, you really, it, it's difficult to do it after the fact. Um, a contractor, another bidder could say, if I knew I could have saved this or not saved that and sold this or sold that, I would have won the bid. Um, so it should actually be put in the original spec what needs to be saved. Um, and again, it can be done. It's just that it, it, it would be, it would add additional cost. And maybe, that, it, maybe not. And who would that, who would bear that cost? Would the individual who wants the item or would the township have to bear, I mean, I don't think we would bear the cost and then just hand it over. No, no, and that's what that's my point is if someone was interested in uh, acquiring that material that they would have to uh, pay that expense. Right. And the other issue that was brought up uh, regarding 507 Burlington Avenue, when I contacted the county about it, um, re uh, History board wanted to get in there. They wanted to take pictures. They may wanted something for artifacts or what have you. And Joe Brickley indicated that it, it, it's unsafe uh, to have somebody go in a building like that. It was gutted. There's nothing of any value in there and that people could not go in and view and take photos and what have you and pick and choose what they wanted because of the unsafe conditions. And I don't know if that would also pertain to this particular building if it's deteriorating more. I know John Brown had indicated something about the going up to the third floor, the stairs weren't yeah, they that great or something. So, yeah. I mean, the stairwells are, are really in bad shape. Yeah. So, in order to let someone know that maybe they can have this beam or that beam and it's going to cost some money, but we're not sure how much. How, how do we do that? That's it, it, again, it'll be very difficult. Um, if during the construction, the contractor separates his materials for his own reasons and he wants to sell them off to someone personally, he can do that. Um, it, it's 
once he takes ownership of the contract, everything in there becomes his. Right. Um, yeah, that's, so unless then, you specify otherwise. Yeah. Let's. Uh, yeah. Well, okay. thank you for all, all that information. Uh, yeah. There's things that I didn't know, and I just, yeah, thank you. All right. All right. Uh, let's see. Number five status of sidewalk installation plan. Mr. Fox, you again. Okay, I, I believe um, uh, you received a copy of our um, our uh, proposal for the the work in front of town hall and public works. Um, yeah. And I guess Richard can speak to that as far as where that money's coming from and, and how that. Yeah, if you remember, you have my got my email that uh, we received the forty five thousand dollar payment for our contract with Stanker and Galetto uh, to contribute towards that and that was approximately the cost of this work. Uh, Harry provided a proposal. I talked to Robin Verso and to Bob Hudnell about the financing way to handle it. And the, the easiest way to do it is to do it as a separate project. At your next meeting, you can do what's called chapter 159 budget amendment. We add the 45,000 as an anticipated revenue. We add a line for the expenditure rather than go through the capital ordinance, which you do when it's part of a larger thing or it's going to go over to the next fiscal year and uh, we get these this simple work done directly out of that right now if the goal is to add that to the money that we have for more a larger project uh, then that would be a more difficult process but it could be done uh, but Terry's uh, advice is that this for sidewalk work there isn't the same kind of savings by scale as you might have with large asphalt jobs. So to do the concrete work in front of the two municipally owned buildings uh, would be, we'd get a reasonable price for. And so my recommendation is that if you all agree with that methodology, that you approve the engineer's proposal tonight so you can get started. And then at your August 2nd meeting, we'll have the chapter 159 resolution so that it's ready to go and the work can get done uh, this fall. Any, any comments on that from the committee? Yeah, let's agreement. go, let's make it happen. Yes. John? Chris? No, I have no problem with it. Okay. Somebody can make a motion to authorize the engineering proposal uh, for the sidewalk work for a uh, anticipated maximum total of $11,500. So moved. Second. All in favor. Uh, okay. Do we need a resolution Aye. for that? No, I think a motion is fine. Okay, so who made that motion? I did. Mike made Wait. the motion, Mike seconded it. Mike? Yes. Okay. And all in favor? Aye. Okay. Aye. Thank Any you. no's? Move forward, thank you. All right, next item. Uh, uh, regulations for short-term residential rentals and slash Airbnbs. Uh, this was something, there was some information in our packet uh, that Mrs. Lohr sent out and uh, who wants to start off uh, on this issue? I received an uh, email from um a resident regarding um, what had happened in another town that Collingswood actually had all kinds of problems with Airbnbs. Um, so um, I don't know. Some of the, some people would. Collingswood, yeah, I saw the Collingswood news item. Um, yeah. They had a, a, a big program 15, 20 years ago on conversions of uh, multifamily homes back to single family. And then the Airbnb thing started up a couple of years ago, and they were seeing short term rentals popping up. Um, yeah, a lot of problems. Trying to, um, trying to mitigate that. Um, have you seen, what have you seen, Mr. Heinhold, and what's the effectiveness of trying to regulate that? So um, I wanted to talk to you all before I spent too much time, because I'm not sure what direction this conversation was going to head in. Um, I can tell you that 
some of the towns in North Jersey were under tremendous pressure because of uh, adverse positions that New York City and New York State took against Airbnb. Uh, was was pushing Airbnbs into northern New Jersey across the bridges and tunnels. And so some of the towns did pretty dramatic responses and ended up in litigation over those issues, which uh, is a costly proposition. So um, I'm not sure what the overall feeling of the committee is in terms of taking uh, a strong position against it versus regulating it and licensing it uh, versus what every other count, uh, town in Burlington County has done thus far, which is nothing. So um, it's worth discussing. I think I, I can tell you that in one town that I'm involved in, there was uh, one or two that popped up there was discussion about it, nothing was done, and there's been no further proliferation of it. And so sort of quietly just uh, existing, um, I think if it, it mushroomed into a larger uh, number of units, uh, then I think it would be revisited. So I don't know, you know, if we've got one, um, there's some practical elements that we need to talk about in terms of how we apply our existing ordinances, the rental inspection ordinance that Janice and I talked about at length, you know, it, theoretically it could be triggered on every change of occupancy. And that's, I don't think a feasible application, but something we need to address. Um, so I think it's just, I wanted to get a sense from the committee of how you felt about the issue and, and whether, you know, what kind of complaints we're getting or if any. The other thing I would say is, is that a lot of times the nature of complaints that are received are really police power issues um, and, and maybe can be addressed in other ways beyond a dramatic response to trying to prohibit those types of uses. Um, for obvious reasons, Airbnb and other entities who are uh, well equipped to address legal confrontations um, are not afraid to do so because it really impacts you know their ability to effectively do business and they can't tolerate losses. Uh, so I think it's one of those things that um, it, you know I want to know what you guys are experiencing and what you're thinking on the issue, but I will say at least you know, in this forum, we need to be careful on how um, how uh, how significantly we we put restrictions in place because it can lead to cost of litigation. I'll start if you may, if I may. Um, I feel that uh, Airbnb is not horrible. Uh, I was surprised to hear one was in Delanco, but as I rode around. I thought, well, this is an upcoming trend, and uh, especially with some of the beautiful vistas we have in town, I, as one of the town leaders would, who believes in the rental ordinance, would like to at least get inside once a year to these B&Bs, like our other rentals, to make sure all the codes are up to uh, speed, especially the fire extinguishers and the uh, GFI outlets, the railings, you know, all that stuff. Now, because I, I guarantee you in our rental ordinance, when you have a change of tenancy during the year, you know, the landlord's not coming back to the, uh, to the municipal building, say, oh, I got a change of tenancy. You know, they wait till the next round. So at least by looking at these uh, Airbnbs, at least once a year, it gives them their license to rent. And it gives us the, uh, the, the look inside when it comes to safety issues. So, uh, you know, at least we're doing that. I don't think we can do it in between each tenant. I think if we were to say no to it, there could be a violation of somebody's civil rights that, you know, we said no to the, you know, renting them a, an apartment for a week or whatever. So that's my take. Mayor, if I can interject. 
And I think John brings up one of the, the points of having this discussion is that our code uh, rental registration uh, regulations are more geared towards those long-term uh, rentals, um, not where something's changing every week or whatever. Um, our code requires not only its registration inspect and inspection every year, but also an inspection at change of tenancy. So it's very difficult to, to enforce that, apply that every time, like for those short-term rentals. So um, we were looking for some guidance. The staff brought to my attention, looking for some guidance on how to handle this particular um, unit um, every time, because the owner had asked about that. And you know, I said, I'll get back to you. Um, in that, um, you know, you just can't do an inspection every week or every time this thing rents and then, you know, somebody leaves and it's got to be inspected again. You could be inspecting 52, 52 times a year and that's not practical. Well, what would be, what would prevent the, the, the owner of a rental property from saying, hey, I, I don't have rental apartments anymore. I, I, I have multiple Airbnbs and um, that's what I'm calling myself now. And I do all, you know, I'm registered on Airbnb and, and but he's got a long-term tenant, you know, for whatever the lease is a year or something. Is that something that's going to fall through the crack uh, and fall through and not be covered by our current rental ordinance and something to capture uh, this new category of, of short-term rentals if it's going to be used as a long term, but it's being called an Airbnb, uh, is that something we need to? Try well, what do you to cover? What, what do you think about the, the fact that we have this inspection upon change of tenancy for the long term? We're getting in there just about every year yeah. anyway. Why do we need an inspection on change of tenancy? Maybe we need to look at it a different way and, and just do away with that. Um, yeah. and, Maybe not. Yeah, well, how I, many have we? How, how many have we actually dealt with in the change of tenancy? How many have you had it since we made that change to the ordinance? Probably a few. Oh, yeah, very few, right? Yeah, I, I mean, we do get them. I, you know, some units have very long-term tenants. You know, um, usually our, our rental stock doesn't see that turnover that that much. Um, we get it. So we do, do get those change of tenancy. The Airbnb poses a whole different, um, set of, you know, circumstances where you can have change of tenancy every week. Um, so what, what do we do with that? Um, but we're getting into the, uh, long-term apartments or rentals. We get into those facilities at least once a year. Right. For inspection. So the, uh, the Airbnb would fall, as John suggested, that they get uh, they get listed once a year for inspection. But our code says, or upon change of tenant occupant tenancy. So how do we not enforce that? Car carve out, you know, air air properties uh, that are uh, registered as a as an Airbnb product. Uh, would be required, a, you know, an inspection annually, regardless. And hotels, motels, uh, you know, we have 130 frontage up there. Would that is still, you know, a piece on on uh, decided what they're going to do with it? Um, you know, along the creek front, if a hotel chain were to come in, uh, we would have to do something uh, that you know Mount Laurel Cinnamons and you know does with their motels. I'm sure they don't just let them go. There has to be some sort of inspection, um, just like an elevator. An elevator get you know carries multiple people constantly, but there's still inspection details in there. They would be um, yeah, they would be state inspections, John. Anything over uh, over three, I think it's over three that aren't owner occupied fall under the state inspection. I don't know, I could be wrong. It may be five, but I think it's three. It's uh, three. Uh, it's uh, three or more once every and the state comes in once every five years. Treating it like a regular rental and getting in there once a year to make sure all the fire uh, safety issues are there and the electrical. And, um, you know, I went into a, a house in Palmyra and I couldn't believe what I was seeing. It was a rental house. 
and they don't have the ordinance that we have and so many violations in this house. I, I picked them out. I said, boy, I could get a job doing this. I'm like, no GFI outlets, no <laughs> railings on the back, no steps on the back. Uh, just absolute, I cannot believe uh, that they would put those um, tenants in, in jeopardy like that. So we, we got to get in at least once a year. So is that something that we want to add into our, you know, as I'm, I'm asking the committee, is that something we want to add into our rental ordinance? To, to, to try to capture the air, this Airbnb situation and that we at least have uh, any property. I would refer, to, I would refer to Doug's purpose. Yeah. It's a one annual inspection. Is this the way to go, Doug? I mean, if, if your general feeling is that there's, I mean, one right now, we've got a little bit of a conflict with the ordinance. Um, we, could, we could fine tune the ordinance and then just see how things play out a little bit. Um, if we get more of them, there could, and particularly if we get complaints associated around them, we could probably do a little bit more in terms of what we require the owners to do and inform their occupants uh, to make sure that they're following the rules. But um, as a first go at this right now, I kind of feel like I don't, you know, it's already 2021, Airbnb has been around for some time. We've got one in town. I don't think we're expecting um, uh, many. And so I think we should just walk slowly on this and correct our, our, our ordinance so that we don't have this uh, question about inspections. And, and then we can sort of gauge and see what happens as, as things go forward. That's, that's exactly where my head was at. It just yeah. seems like Airbnb kind of lends itself to self-policing because, you know, they don't want bad reviews. If they have a junk box house, they're not going to get rentals. So there is an element where they just kind of have to fall in line with, you know, I completely agree with the a, an annual inspection, but beyond that, I it, it seems impractical to start charging ahead writing ordinances about this when, when it is just one, one unit that we know of. I mean, who, I don't know. I, I, I think this one is kind of a non-issue at this point. All right, so we'll, we'll take small steps on this and see what, see what we can come up with as far as an annual uh, or not, whether we wanna, anything else on this topic? Right, uh, seven, Township Property, West Avenue Woods areas. I think we covered this one. Yep. We need to, anything more on that? Uh, number eight, uh, Joint Land Use Board recommendation for apartment conversion incentive. Uh, this was, uh, there was an email string that was attached to the agenda. Uh, this is going back to, I think, March. And uh, uh, it was pushed down on the calendar to now to kind of reopen it uh, based on everything else that was going on in the springtime. Uh, Michelle Taylor had initially proposed uh, an area uh, for rehabilitation uh, that was pretty large. Um, if everyone had a chance to review that email string and what your thoughts are for that and what the need is or what, where, 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 where we're trying to end up. Um, back in 2007, I don't know if you remember, Doug, you and I were working on doing the same type of thing, converting uh, multi-rentals into single families. And at that time, uh, we actually had a bank involved um, who would um, actually loan the money for the restoration to the homeowner at, at a lower rate. Of course, the bank rates are so low now. Um, and I actually prepared an agreement with the bank, an agreement with the township. Um, it wasn't a tax abatement that I recall. Um, but at that time, I used Collingswood's documents. So that's what they did. They had a bank. They actually secured the loans with a bond for the bank. So um number one i think the area that she's asking for 
would be something like what happened many years ago. I don't know, John, if you remember when a group from the Joint Land Use Board and part of the Township Committee um, declared a large part of Delanco in a redevelopment plan and it was pretty disastrous. So I think we should just contain it to maybe the areas where we have the most rentals and they seem to be on Burlington Avenue, the, the bigger rental complexes that seem to, now I don't know whether that is, um, you know, considered or allowed, because I think that's what we were trying to do with that one redevelopment plan. It was supposed to just be for the commercial district on Burlington Avenue, and they wound up doing most of the town. Fern, do you remember that? Because our street was in there. Yes, I remember. Um, yeah. The, yeah, it wasn't um, most of the town. It was, it, you know, it went down Ramcocas Avenue when it wasn't supposed to. It was the commercial district from the Cooper Street down to the bridge. I think it was a larger area than that. They took it, but I, it, I could be they mistaken. Took it down Cocos. It, and we had Willow Street on there. Um, yeah. yeah. It, it was a fairly large area. It uh, was. I mean, I think this would be a nice. Uh, thing to do for the town to convert some of these apartments. Um, most of the landlords that have some of these apartment houses, a lot of them are out of state or certainly out of town, so they aren't owner occupied. And uh, some of them are in, even though they pass the rental inspection, some of them are in really poor condition. Um, so uh, I, I don't know what kind of response we would get, but it's certainly worth while looking into. The documents that I had prepared would maybe be amended to include a different type of deal, um, or we can start from scratch. But I did get the documents from Collingswood. I did a lot of research on it, and uh, it fell through because the uh, real estate market crashed in 2007 and eight. I think. Um, where um, it just, there, there was, it was gone. It, it wasn't worth doing at that time. So that was I'm my a, uh, I, I've been an opponent to this idea only because the math does not work when you take uh, the amount of income uh, being produced by a rental unit versus the amount needed to convert it back. Even if there is a tax abatement, it's still, Abatements do wear out, they do expire. Uh, you, you know, there's no investor that's gonna wanna take a step backwards. And as you know, I own a half a double, if I were able to buy the other side of the double and convert it into a single family home, I would have a $500,000 home on Ash Street. And that just doesn't, it doesn't work. And the, the other thing, there's movement in Washington about rezoning and looking at zoning issues to address the housing shortage in America. And that is uh, they want, they're looking at uh, being, to be allowed to add an in-law suite now with plumbing and you know, just like the old ways, whereas Delanco, I believe put the kibosh on uh, no more of that. I think you missed the boat on this because now with a housing shortage, they're starting to look into uh, rezoning to uh, split houses uh, such as your windows. okay so uh i i think i think we would be spinning wheels on this yeah janice and i were talking uh, last week uh the same thing that you you bring up john as far as the economics of, of a, a rental property brings in so much more uh to a to the owner than you know converting it back to a, a single family home uh, thing I just read today is that part of the infrastructure package that's uh, being proposed to Congress or working its way through Congress really is is the incentives are going the other direction to encourage uh, um, higher density and basically uh, to eliminate zoning for the single family home that uh, mm -hmm. in communities and so uh, because of the housing shor shortages. So uh, uh, the, I think the stronger currents moving in the other direction as much as we would like to um, provide some kind 
kind of incentive to go back to a single family home or reduce the number of rental apartments and so forth uh, in a community. So um, I, I, as I was saying, I, I think the window of opportunity is, uh, is past us on this. And yeah. whatever. I think Collingswood, when they did it, they did it at an opportune time, but also the bank loans, because see, they got the, the rest got a bank loan for a lesser interest rate and Collingswood actually uh, you know bonded to guarantee the loan so the bank was uh, encouraged to give these loans at a lower interest rate now when I did this research um, Delanco Federal Savings agreed to do the loans uh, at a lesser rate and um, they hadn't actually asked us for a bond or anything, um, but uh, it didn't it didn't pan out because of what happened with the market. So um, values of properties went down. So maybe we did miss the boat. Maybe John's right, uh, but I mean I did do a lot of research on it. But I I don't think the tax abatement is enough either because even if it I think what was the recommended time period for that tax abatement, Janice. Five years. Five years. Yeah, five years, yeah. I mean, and how much of an abatement? It doesn't seem to be enough because some of the apartment houses that we have, you know, they have four or five, six apartments. And um, well, I don't let's, know. Let's, uh, you know, individually and as a community keep looking for ways and, and keep our ears open for if there's some program that uh, can can help uh, help us move to a, a place where we want to be with uh, either fixing up uh, uh, properties that are uh, in need of a little TLC. Uh, the county program is uh, really geared towards uh, um, lower income uh, or it's only your eligibility is is for has strict income limits. Um, and it only gives you loans up to $20,000, which uh, in today's construction doesn't go far. So anyway. Uh, I, think I think our code enforcement could be, uh, and our rental inspection could be enforced a little bit better than it. I know the last couple of years we haven't been able to get inside, but I think that some of these rental properties need, uh, need to be our code enforcement needs to apply what we do for a regular resident to the rental properties because they are not applied. Yep. Uh, I mean, you can just take a look at some of these rental properties, the paint's chipping off. And uh, so that needs to be recognized. One thing um, to add to this apartment conversion would be that someone just uh, texted me was the number of school children would lessen because that, that does, that does affect our schools, a lot of rentals. So, and that is something to consider, but. You know, one other thing to keep in mind with the co around of 2025 coming up, I did read an article also that the, uh, you know, people are looking at these, uh, these, these multifamily duplexes to uh, look for tax incentives to convert them into affordable housing for some of the uh, towns that uh, don't have their quotas, or we may get a new number also. So um, that's another problem with housing shortage. And one more thing, there there is a rental shortage, uh, which has driven the price up from a $1,200 unit to a $1,600 uh, rental fee. Now with higher rents, you, you know, you might have a better clientele to choose from. But uh, rentals, I know somebody personally that had a heck of a time finding a rental um, just because people who have them are not, not leaving. And uh, that's my take. I Thanks. think we've reached the end of all our discussion items. Uh, I think we need to, we've got an executive session with a couple topics to go through. And uh, Mayor. Quickly, I, it was one thing I noted in our discussions that I didn't bring up when we adopted it, but the ordinance where we're going to authorize the easement to the neighboring property on the Burlington Avenue for, foreclosure piece. Um, did, did we put an amount in for what we're going to charge 
that resident for the easement. I had suggested to Janice maybe $500 in legal costs, but I don't know uh, if the committee felt that that was appropriate or had some other thought. $1,000. 1000 in legal costs? Yeah, to cover legal, administrative. My time. 1000 plus legal costs. Okay. So versus 500 plus legal costs. That's what we did agree upon, Richard? No, I'm, that, I'm just, John was thinking that it, that was the legal cost, but I think oh, okay. the proposal is a dollar amount plus legal costs which could be up to $1,500 in legal costs, maybe. Well, what's his sewer connection gonna, gonna cost him? Does no, he have to connect? Yeah, whatever it's two, I think it's between two and 3,000 off the top of my head. Yeah. Um, I, I mean, I think a thousand is appropriate plus legal costs if the committee's okay with that. I just wanna note it and then Janice and I will finalize that form. So when it gets published, it's, it's in there. And we won't charge him back rent. <laughs> All right. He doesn't yeah. have the easement yet. <laughs> do we? Do we need any any official salutation on that, uh, Richard? No, no. I think I think what Doug is saying is because you just introduced it. It's yes. Not like you haven't adopted anything, so you, it'll be fixed in there. Janice will actually include it in the language when she advertises it, All right. and it'll be on your agenda on August second. All right. Uh, so that's $1,000 plus legal costs. $1,000 plus legal costs. Okay. All right. Um, may I ask a question? Janice, sure, do you ever do correspondence? Did I miss something? No, she got it. No, we did not do correspondence yet. Oh, you did. I oh, yeah, you do. No, because I do have correspondence. Oh, I know he asked for it. <laughs> yeah. Oh, we did. Oh, I'm sorry. I did not. I, I didn't think I heard any correspondence now. Okay. I think we skipped right to the discussion items. <laughs> yeah, they sat between the COVID and the discussion items. Yeah, so, yeah. There's more correspondence. <laughs> yes, one piece of correspondence. We see, uh, received a letter. It was forwarded to everyone um, from Stephen Jass requesting uh, appointment to the Economic Development Advisory Board. Everyone did get that? Yes. Yes. Um, I looked at the current uh, membership. Um, according to our code, uh, the, the, as it's structured on, uh, for membership, there are currently no openings on the Economic Advisory Council, unless I missed a resignation somewhere. But we have um, the code says seven members, one from Township Committee, one from the Joint Land Use Board, which is Terry Mater. A bus one business owner and four um, citizens, citizenry, which um, we have those four. All Christine right. DeSani, Barbara Tao, Joe Chaska, and Shirley Rossi. But Joe Chaska would be the business owner. Mm. Well, business John, owner? Brown, John Brown's on that too. John Brown, I have you listed as the business owner. Oh. And who's the and, top committee member? Christine, Christine Holland. So Christine is the uh, late Christine is the Township Committee member and their liaison. Terry Mater is the Joint Land Use Board member. John Brown is the business, and the four uh, other members are Christine DeSani, Barbara Tal, Joe Chaska, and Shirley Rossi. Now, so Barbara Tal is their secretary. So does that count as a member? Yes, yes, that board can can have the secretary as a voting member. Oh, okay. You permitted alternate positions. No, our our. The, mem the, the, the code, remember this is chapter 18 of the, of the township code sets up the membership for the uh, uh, Economic Advisory Council. So technically under the code, no, there, there's, no, there's no alternates, but it's an advisory council. So, you know, it's not like, it's not like a planning board where you have strict statutory um, membership requirements. So we could change it. Honorary citizen member. Yeah. Again, it's it's advisory. It has no legal. Um, we'll make any decisions. Yeah, I mean, I, I, unless there's some bad precedent, I don't see a problem with 
with making an appointment for an additional non-specified member. Yeah, me either. So, um, Doug, since this is advisory council under chapter 18, is it, would there be any real technical problems with the, appointing an additional member? Um, I mean, you know, technically we have a code with provisions in it about our makeup of it. So if we're going to add somebody else, technically we should <coughs> recognize that in the code. I, I don't have a problem doing that. It would be easy enough to do. It's just yeah. something we should do. Yeah. I didn't know Terry Mater was on our board. As the joint land use board representative. Yeah. She's probably never attended. No, I don't even know if she knows she's a member. <laughs> I would make a recommendation that we uh, change our change and add a, an additional member so that we can actually do it formally. Who's Doug, our, don't you think we our, could do that? Oh, wait, I think I already answered it. Christine's the liaison. Okay, I'm sorry. Yeah. I mean, Doug, is that something that they could introduce tonight? Uh, ordinance 15? Uh, no, I'd rather not introduce the ordinance tonight, but if you want to put the um, okay. appointment in motion and then we can have the ordinance normalize what we've done, I don't have a problem with that okay. given what's at stake. All right. So a motion to appoint uh, Stephen we make the motion. Before you make the motion. Go ahead. Go ahead. So we're, get, we're going to change our code books and our ordinance for this. I'm in favor of having Mr. Jazz on, on the uh, on the committee. Uh, but we're going to go through the expense of changing our ordinance to uh, to make this happen. Yeah, you know, it is a public meeting, the Economic Advisory Council. What's to stop him as a member of the public? Sure. Just coming to the meeting and you know, hey, any any comments from the public? You know, he can chime in then. What? I'm kind of with firm. Why go through all the red tape when he can just show up until there is an opening? Um, all right, let's keep it simple and uh, we'll advise Mr. Jast that at present, uh, the welcome. membership it, economic development is, is full. And uh, I don't know if there's a term expiration of someone that would like uh, more, some time off, but uh, um, We'll go with that. So, any other correspondence, Mrs. Jazz, Mrs. Mrs. Lore, Mrs. Jazz. Sorry, Marlene. <laughs> That's Marlene. That is it. Okay, That's I it. have a uh, something as, as far as correspondence that, uh, out of respect to the Joint Land Use Board, because this request was made uh, on the uh, multi-family housing uh, conversion. Do we need, uh, should we send a letter to the Joint Land Use Board stating that uh, we did discuss this and we've missed the boat, you know, and we as the committee um, at this time don't want to move forward on this? I, I, I don't think we should bury it. I th think we should come up with a crafty mathematical solution, a gift that for an investor who may, because with a housing shortage could come a family of five who needs uh, that space to convert it back into a four bedroom home. And perhaps maybe we should have an incentive on the table in our toolbox. And maybe this should be referred to the Economic Advisory Council on uh, what it would take to um, make an enticement of this. Cause it's not a horrible idea to convert these structures back to single family homes, but uh, let's see how the housing shortage pans out. And maybe we could still put something on the table. Interesting idea. Okay. All right. Uh, let's see, I think we're, we're done there. Uh, a resolution for executive session. It's resolution 2021-97 to go into executive session for attorney clients and personnel. So moved on 2021-97, executive. I'll pass Okay. Okay. The recording has stopped. All right, and oh. see, we need to the committee. 
Mrs. Lohr, Mr. Schwab, uh, the chief needs to come in. And I think that's... Not Kitty, correct? I think that's it. Yeah, just the chief is the extra participant. Okay. Harry, I think, uh, good night. Thank you. Good night, everyone. Thanks. Good night. Good night. Good night. Good night. I'm sorry, who made the motion and who seconded? My motions. Mr. I Brenton. seconded. Thank you. Second by Ms. Holland. All in favor. Uh, Doug, you're coming in, I right? Am. I am. Oh, yeah. Let's see, did everyone make it back? Let's see, John, Chris, I assume. It's okay, there's Chris down there. All right. Uh, we have no action to take coming out of executive, so a motion to adjourn, please. So moved. Second. Second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Thank you very much tonight. Thank you. Good night, the recording everybody. has stopped. Good night. Have a good night. Good night, good night everybody. Thank night. you. Thanks, Aaron. You're welcome. Have Thank you, Aaron. Night. Thank you, Aaron.